Uh, right. Good morning, everybody. Sorry about that. That's just what you need—a fire alarm just as the, uh, the the conference starts. Right. We'll, we'll try again. So, uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to Network Rail's uh, Trap Renewals Engineering Conference, uh, which is being supported by the Permanent Way Institution. Uh, so, my name is Liam Jackson. I'm the Program Engineering Manager uh, for Technical Services in Network Rail, and it's my pleasure today to act as the meeting chair for the first ever online version of the Network Rail Track Renewals uh, Engineering Conference. So to start with, if we just cover some, some housekeeping for the conference. So uh, as attendees, you, you will have noticed that you've arrived and you have been uh, muted by default and your webcams have been switched off. Now there will be opportunity to interact with uh, the presenters um, and this will be through the scheduled Q&A sessions. Uh, and if you look at your agendas, there are uh, scheduled Q&A sessions after every two presentations. In order to ask a question, um, on the right-hand side of your uh, screen, you should see a box uh, with, the, uh, question, with uh, the question functionality. Questions can be submitted at any point during the presentations. Um, you don't have to wait for the Q&A sessions to start to submit a question. However, it would help me facilitate the Q&A if uh, at the start of the question you please type the name of the person that you wish to direct the question to and then follow that with your question. Um, all of the conference including the Q&As will be recorded uh, and the recording will be made available uh, on the PWI website shortly after today. Uh, another thing to note today is that audience polling uh, will be used at various points throughout the conference. Now, audience polling is an opportunity for the presenters to ask the audience a question and gain audience uh, opinions. Uh, so just to give you all an idea of how that's going to work, we're going to have a quick practice on that now. So you should now see a, a quick poll. So which country has the fastest uh, passenger train service? If you just click um, whichever you feel is the right answer, we'll just let that run for a few seconds. Okay, can we show the answer now, please? Right, good. So the good news is, is that you all are now uh, trained in using the, the polling functionality. Uh, the bad news is that uh, only 28% of you got the right answer. The, 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 the correct answer is, is uh, China, and it's the Shanghai TransRapid system. Unfortunately, I'm not going to give out any prizes for the correct answers today. So now that everyone is happy with uh, the, the housekeeping and the functionality, uh, let's have a look at today's agenda. So we've got a very full agenda today with top speakers from across Network Rail and the Trap Renewals community. Uh, and as you can see, we've got scheduled Q&A sessions throughout the day. So the first half of the conference will feature PWI presidential address from John Edgley, uh, and this will be followed by an update on the NR track technical strategy from, from Gareth Evans. The first half will also include two project specific presentations, one from Nick Matthews in the South Rail Systems Alliance uh, and one from Tony Magali, Stuart Witts from, from Murphy's. We will then break at uh, 10.45 to 11 uh, and then the second half we will reconvene with more project specific presentations from Amit Masania and James Murray in the Central Rail Systems Alliance, uh, followed by Jen McKinney and Nick Colesmore from Manchester Metrolink. Uh, Network Rail Engineering Expert Brian Whitney will be giving his reflections on the lessons learned in the 20 years since the Hatfield disaster and then we'll be concluding with a project presentation from Dave Woods and team at Trends Pennine Routes Upgrade. So that leads us on to the uh, PWI presidential address. So uh, if you'd like, I would now like to introduce uh, John Edgley. So John has recently been asked to take up the role of Interim Chief Technology Officer for Network Rail having also acted as interim chief engineer for the last six months during the COVID outbreak. Formerly, he was the chief track engineer for Network Rail, a post he held since 2016. And prior to this, he was professional head of track for Network Rail. John's career spans over 28 years, which encompasses infrastructure maintenance, track renewals, railway plant and multidisciplinary engineering projects. And more recently, leading the technical authority track engineering function within Network Rail. 
and he's now currently the president of the Permanent Way Institution. So John, you should have control, so over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much. I'm hoping everybody can hear me now. Uh, I might fidget ever so slightly, just try to make sure that you can all see me on the camera. Um, so I'd like to also to welcome everybody to the event. Um, there's been a huge, huge amount of work put into organising this, uh, not least by Liam, who's uh, comparing for the day and I think has done a great job so far. Uh, and there's a moral lesson in there somewhere that no matter how much planning you do, something will always pop up, which takes you by surprise. So this morning it was the, the alarm, wasn't it not? Um, additional, additionally, I'd like to play tribute to um, Kate Hatwell and the PWI team who have done a fantastic job organising us today. And fingers crossed, everything will follow to plan uh, moving forward. So as Liam said, there's going to be many great speakers today. Uh, I do think it is unfortunate, though, notwithstanding the opportunities provided to us through um, uh, online systems such as this, that one of the main reasons we exist in the PWI is to uh, help networking. Um, so here's fingers crossed, or fingers crossed, you can see that hand, um, that in the next um, few months, COVID will die down and we can resume normal operations and actually maybe learn from the blended approach of, of uh, online systems and face-to-face -face events. So um, I believe I've got control of the screen, so let me press a button see if that works. I don't think I have. Kate, could you change screen for me, please? Thank you, Kate. Um, so I'd like just to talk through some of the challenges I see for the UK rail industry. Now, these are my personal views. Um, I hope uh, most of them will be familiar or at least will resonate with you. So it's impossible to talk about challenges without referring to COVID. Let's be perfectly honest. It has been the thing which has frankly got in the way of our normal lives over the last few months um, and up until the last few weeks um, I think we've been recovering very nicely. The last stats I saw um, indicated passenger footfall was round about 50 percent so that was really positive. Unfortunately we have had this recent setback with this second wave kicking in uh, and uh, local lockdowns in South Wales and the north of, the, uh, the, of England and actually around the UK, particularly universities and, and, and other locations. So a real challenge for us, not just in terms of how we manage the welfare of our staff, but actually going back to that footfall point, if footfall is down, revenue is down. If revenue is down, that means there's less money to go around, not just for the government, but for the railways. We work within a control period, so we have a re revenue stream which is, or a funding stream which is set, but I would absolutely expect reasonable conversations to be going on in the coming weeks and months about how we best spend our funds. So I think watch this space, the government could opt for uh, extra funds to kickstart the UK economy through construction, or they could actually approach the railways and say, can we cut back some of our spending? So a challenge for us in the immediate term, for sure. The next point being asset reliability and performance. Uh, and I would um, cheekily call it eye candy. I want to just give a couple of graphs to show you some stats, really. So the top one is on time trend and the bottom one is delay minutes accrued by track points and signaling electrical power, basically our assets. So. Um, the theme of COVID. The reliability of our assets is on increasing trends, so that's a good news story. However, performance prior to COVID was recovering slightly, but challenged, shall we say. COVID has come along and the on-time trend of the remaining trains has rocketed upwards. Um, that is masking a big challenge that we have. And indeed, the delay minutes identify were pottering around a flat line of delay minutes, notwithstanding COVID, as you can see on the right side of the graph. We, as engineers, 
need to make sure what we are installing is reliable and performs properly because we contribute to the overall performance cake. When we return to normal operations and normal passenger numbers, again, we will see these challenges of how reliable can we make our infrastructure? Can it be more reliable when we install it? What more can we do? So that's a big challenge for us, for sure. The next point is about affordability. Um, all of you listening on the call will be familiar with conversations about unit rate uh, issues. Um, the theme back to the scarcity I expect of funding in the next few months and years brings that challenge all the more to the fore. So affordability, what, how can we actually achieve the right quality but more cost effectively? That's a big issue. And the final two points, although I've rolled them up as one bullet point on this slide, are really around climate change and decarbonisation. So taking decarbonisation first, well, actually, the biggest opportunity ahead of us um, in the UK to meet our decarbonisation targets, that's for the railway and indeed for the whole of the uh, UK PLC, is actually electrification. So I foresee a massive electrification programme moving forward. Maybe that will be where the UK governments decide to spend their money. Let's hope so. Um, but that is one of those burning opportunities. But it doesn't start and end at electrification. We have an issue and a challenge of, do you know what? How can we review the materials that we are using to have a smaller carbon footprint? Um, what tools uh, can we also use to that same effect or change to that same effect? And how can we be more effective and savvy about our travelling? Maybe online conversations, possibly, but that's a big challenge for us. And then segueing finally to climate change for this slide, um, I think it's fair to comment, um, but without going into any great depth, the recent tragedy we saw at Stonehaven was in part caused by heavy rainfall or just checking the words, a convective thunderstorm. Now, whether that was directly linked to climate change or not, there is definitely a theme that as climate change bites us more moving forward, we will absolutely see the same rainfall, not an increase in rainfall, but the same rainfall coming down in more discrete pockets. Harder rainfall in smaller locations through the year. Summer and winter more focused, so it's not going to be evenly spread as we expect it now, or as evenly spread. So the challenge for us is to think, well, actually, is our infrastructure sufficiently robust to withstand these effects? Probably not in places, clearly. Um, so do we know where the weak areas are? What are we going to do? How do we engineer the solutions to those challenges? So big opportunities, big challenges for the UK. Uh, let me try the button again. Oops. I think I've got it. Um, so what's the focus of the PWI given this backdrop? Well, the reason why we exist is to support our members. So we've continued to support um, through the new strange world that we live in of COVID, um, upping the online presence that we've got and focusing on social media. Indeed, uh, the PWI, through Stephen and Kate and the wider team, have put a huge, huge effort into uh, upping our game on uh, our website uh, and CRM system. So the website will be coming on live, uh, online, the revised one in 2021, as indeed the new customer relationship management system. And that's part of the strategy to improve the service and support to all of you. Uh, we also have moved into a, a new world of online presentations from each of the section uh, uh, areas. Um, and that has been quite amazing. I've seen increases of uh, attendances to the, to the presentations, in some cases double or even treble. Uh, and that is a huge opportunity for us. And indeed, I'm aware people from Italy or even India fo uh, phoned or videoed conferenced in to watch some of the videos, which couldn't have been conceivable when we did the traditional face-to-face -face meetings. So an opportunity as well as a change. 
Uh, we've continued our training. Um, so we are very much business as usual, undertaking training courses, but in the new virtual classrooms. Uh, so that is a great opportunity uh, and uh, also a very deliberate subliminal, not very subliminal, but a very clear note that we're open for business and happy to train people um, as and where uh, you have the need. The PWI also has, um, as one of its reasons for being, uh, is encouraging people to achieve professional registration. And we've seen a very pleasing, steady progress in that area over the last few months. Um, so those of you who have not yet achieved chartered and corporated uh, or engineering technician status, um, I encourage you to, just checking a note, I encourage you to consider that way forward. So um, moving on, I think I'll talk about Joan Heary's themes. So corporate membership and the young people's plan. So Joan is our previous president, uh, dived into these particular areas and the vice presidents you can see off on the right hand side, uh, are all seven of them, they are uh, supporting the role forward of those themes, in particular uh, a focus on supporting universities um, and helping uh, the new community, the fresh blood of the industry coming through uh, and being more vibrant. So that moves me very nicely onto uh, my theme, the President's theme, which I'll have a slide on in just a moment. But I would like to um, just read a comment to you, something I particularly liked from a conversation I had with uh, Stephen Barber, PWI's CEO. Um, and something I'll tell you, Stephen, I know you're listening as well. I'm going to steal this and try to pass it off as my own, very ineffectually, because I've told everybody my, my cunning plan. But the quote is, I want to see an industry fuller of competent, informed and enthused people. I think that encapsulates what the PWI is about very, very nicely. So my theme. Some of you, probably most of you will be aware thus far that I've chosen industry competency as my theme. Um, so in short, I see there's three layers of competence. This is my personal view of the world. There's the certified skills. We're familiar with certified skills, people who can use tools or do certain safety critical activities. We've got that. We understand that, well, how all that works. The engineering council registration, I mentioned uh, charter status, etc. earlier, so we also understand how that works. That's very well covered through the industry. But that yellow section, I think, needs a lot better and more focus in joining up our activities across the industry. Um, just reading um, a little note uh, from when the PWI was first set up uh, in Nottingham in 1884. Uh, just read this for a second. Um, so one of the purposes of the PWI was to adopt a standard competency in the art of inspection and work of maintaining and to provide a certificate or diploma of competence to any person who shall have acquired practical knowledge and experience of such work. So I think there's more to do in that area. Each company has its professional competency regime. Network Rail does, TfL does, Irish Rail, uh, Translink in Northern Ireland, indeed all of our supply chain uh, in terms of uh, contractor and consultant. So I've made um, overtures and had conversations with a number of people thus far. Everyone's been very kind to me. They, they've agreed that we're in uh, the right set of mind for this. And I have plans over the next few weeks and months to uh, organise some show and tells where we in the PWI will suck in these different frameworks, map them, get certain common themes. And I'm expecting by the end of the year, we'll have a, a couple of workshops get an alignment and at the end of it have a first steps of a common competency framework agreed. So my next slide. So I think it's fair to say I've talked about Joan and her presidential themes. I've talked about mine. I think it'd be worthwhile sharing the future president's themes as well. 
So Nick Millington will follow on from me uh, next year as president. He's a number of particular activities he's very passionate about. And these are my words, so I'm kind of paraphrasing them, but in, in broad speaking, safety and performance is where his uh, themes are gonna be. And then following on from Nick, Peter Dearman. Uh, and Peter Dearman, for those of you who know him, is a stalwart of the electrification community. And his passion is to, in essence, enact uh, the same for electrification that I'm advocating uh, for the track and permanent way disciplines and I'll be working away on this year. So at this point, I am happy to hand over, uh, I think it's to Liam who will introduce Gareth Evans. So th thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for that, John. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gareth Evans, uh, Professional Head of Track for Network Rail. So Gareth is a Chartered Engineer uh, with a BA in Metallurgy and the Science of Materials from Oxford University. His early career was in the steel industry, uh, with seven years spent manufacturing railway products and seven years working on technology and asset management. In 2009, uh, Gareth joined Network Rail's HQ Track Engineering team and has been involved in national projects to introduce new technology for rail management, uh, track engineering, uh, developing new standards uh, and competency requirements to support wider business change. Uh, he's been the professional head of track since 2016 and has accountability for network rails, risk controls framework and technical strategy for track engineering. So Gareth, you should have control now, over to you. Thank you, Liam, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, good morning, all. It's my pleasure to be part of this brilliant seminar that um, Liam and Kate have done a great job in organising today. Um, I thought I'd like to give everyone the benefit of some of my thinking around our future track technical strategy, um, or how do we respond as track engineers to the four challenges that John outlined only a few minutes ago. This is very much a working draft. Oops. Trigger happy there with my buttons. This is very much a working draft and it's the early stages of development. So um, I'm treating this really as the world's largest working group I've ever had the pleasure of uh, coordinating. I'm very much in listening mode. So as we go through the presentation, you'll see what stage things are at. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to working with colleagues across Network Rail and the wider industry to build this in future weeks and months. So we need a vision for track engineering. Here's the one I've come up with, with the help of um, some members of my team. And the essence really is we need to balance the outputs that the uh, UK PLC and the, the, the general public expect from our railway um, with the inputs. So we must maintain and improve on our current safety record. We have to build in reliability and resilience in terms of climate change uh, and uh, availability of the network. But we've got to balance that with the needs of the economy. And as John's just outlined, our current situation is uh, putting this into a starker focus than it's ever been. And the purpose of creating this new technical strategy. For me, it's about supporting collaboration across network rail and across the wide industry through our supply chain, um, aligning our regional asset strategies with our new regions who are standing up uh, in the middle of next month with those wider um, UK PLC requirements and then the need to develop new capability with emerging technology uh, competency process uh, and equipment. And the strategy has really got to encompass the full asset life cycle. So I'm not just focusing here on maintenance and inspection. This is about the end to end life of each of our track assets. It's also got to align with the strategy and requirements of uh, the interfaces we have with other assets and those other asset disciplines. And you'll see as we go on that um, that's certainly where more work is required in terms of what we've developed so far. Now in building the strategy, we had to 
really come up with some assumptions to help us have somewhere to start. So one of the assumptions that we, um, we've decided upon is that we're not going to rip up our railway and build something completely radical. In principle, we'll have steel wheels running on steel rails and that will be unchanged. That's probably one of the, of the four assumptions we've defined so far, that's probably the one with the most certainty about it, because as you'll see, the other three very much um, kind of reflect on John's challenge uh, and our post-COVID world. Um, what will the demands on our railway be in future? How quickly will it recover in terms of passenger demand? Um, do we need to start thinking about uh, shaping it for a, more of a balance between freight and passenger? And how as Network Rail will be organised in future, how as an industry will be organised in future? In terms of how the strategy fits in with the work we do in Network Rail and, to, and planning uh, the management of our assets, I think for me that this diagram speaks volumes. Um, I've pinched it from a, a colleague, Tim Kersley, in our asset management team. On the left, you have all the work our regions will do to translate Network Rail's vision and objectives through to delivery plans for uh, asset inspection, maintenance, renewal and enhancement via their strategic plans and asset strategies. And on the right, you've got a, a box that encapsulates the main work of the new technical authority. And the asset strategy and policy are both key elements of that national level framework. The policy provides asset specific principles and rules that regions use to build their medium and long-term asset strategies, supported by decision support tools um, that the technical authority or regions might develop. The strategy then sets the long-term direction for the development of future capability improvement in track engineering, aligned to those long-term industry objectives and supporting the implementation, implementation of policy by regions. My inspiration for starting this work uh, a few weeks ago was finding out that the rail industry in Great Britain and the UK is about to issue a new technical strategy. Uh, I think it's going to be issued next month, published next month. It's a new strategy has been issued driven by business need and to try and uh, stimulate uptake of technology at pace to drive efficiency and performance of our railway. It's been led by the technical leadership group under RDG and it's been endorsed by a range of uh, senior and high profile industry leaders and consulted widely through the industry. Uh, it sets out five key objectives, which you can see sort of middle top of the slide there, uh, directed at four outcomes for the UK economy and the, uh, and the public who use the railway. And for me, this speaks volumes and it's, it's a great starting point for building an asset strategy. The format of the new rail technical strategy is built of sort of four uh, pillars. Um, so each of the objectives has a breakdown in terms of some specific goals. And here you have the goals related to reliable and easy to maintain railway infrastructure. The strategy outlines why those goals are appropriate, what's the current state of the art, and then gives five and 20 year vision statements for what as an industry um, we are intending to achieve. This is the model that I've started to adopt for track technical strategy. Uh, and I think it's very helpful in terms of getting setting out some statements we can all get behind and build upon. Uh, noting there are other goals within the rail technical strategy for decarbonisation um, and low emissions, um, accessible railway for all. Um, so topics such as looking at decarbonising our supply chain, uh, are really key to what we'll need to do in future. But there's a lot of detail, a lot of detail in the strategy. So I wanted to try and boil it down to a small number of themes. So here's my start for 10. I'm sure you'll have some of your own uh, and you could certainly uh, no doubt have some good ideas we can build upon here. But my first idea is around optimising design using our digital capability in future. So this is a um, simulation of how the railway performs in service, um, digital information to help optimise the design process, 
uh, and understanding how duty conditions affect our infrastructure. Closely linked to this is introduction of new materials based on advanced manufacturing techniques to eliminate as far as possible the degradation of um, the railway and certainly optimising the wheel rail interface to optimise the forces at that interface. Once we have these two elements of design um, optimised and targeted, I think we need to look at um, our world leading digital, mechanised and automated construction and maintenance techniques. And I think there's, there's plenty of work going on in this space already. There's potentially uh, opportunity to build that further. Once we've installed our railway, we then need to look at inspection and monitoring. Uh, and for me, a theme um, could be 100% automation, non-intrusive monitoring and fault diagnosis. This could be through um, mobile or fixed installations of sensors. But I think for me, this is a, one area where we do need to develop uh, our thinking uh, and programs to take us in the right direction. And lastly, we collect lots and lots of data. There's a great opportunity, uh, and I think it's essential that we convert that to wisdom-rich asset management and risk management through the capabilities we develop over the coming years. So my final couple of slides are, my, are the initial work we've done to develop the vision statements for track engineering in the space of reliable infrastructure, which is easy to maintain. So take first up, improve reliability and availability of existing systems. The kind of themes that we're developing and my team are helping me work on are around looking at how we change the standard designs to uh, introduce componentry and systems with proven uh, in, uh, reliability improvements, um, e.g. shifting from 756 to 760 infrastructure where it's appropriate to do so. Improving our knowledge of system behavior and degradation, uh, for example, using the intelligent infrastructure capability we're developing and big data to tell us about degradation rates and looking at strategies for in, introducing um, managed track position more widely. How are we doing this? Well, we've got a number of programs that are already in flight, such as optimizing um, point, op point operating equipment, developing new specifications to help us um, procure the latest technology with, far, with great improvements in reliability. We're looking at optimizing materials for switches and crossings and coatings, um, developing new modular bearer joints, building an enhanced SNC system within some European research. Um, using whole system modeling and remote condition monitoring. The next topic is around safe and rapid inspection and repair. And here is where automation, um, more mobile monitoring uh, is really comes to the fore. So our five year vision here is about extending trainborne inspection to include more and more aspects of SNC. It's using unattended measurement system, for example, on service trains. It's using uh, risk-based inspection and maintenance approaches um, to uh, apply that to our inspection and maintenance regimes through our standards, um, based on measured degradation rates, again, through systems such as our intelligent infrastructure platform. And potentially in the next five years, looking at some early implementation of robotics and artificial intelligence to identify, and in some cases, rectify track faults. And we have many, again, many programs in flight here, looking at uh, enhancing our rail floor detection, looking at expanding our PLPR vision inspection capability and the, the algorithms that drive that to automated inspection, um, and looking at improvements to weld repair of, uh, of, of plane line and S&C componentry, uh, and auto autonomous rail mounted vehicles for inspection purposes. And my last slide is covers the theme of a step change in reliability and availability and the whole life cost of our assets. And here we're talking about more radical change. And this is really being driven by our European research, which is looking at next generation um, plane line and SNC systems, digital, digital twin technology to uh, model uh, the performance of components and systems 
uh, and we're building concepts and prototypes in this space. But we've got to make sure that we have statements allow us to um, articulate the vision for how we implement this new technology so that we can then start to talk about the business case, the, the requirements, the more detailed requirements for how we adapt and adopt new designs into our existing infrastructure. So what are my next steps? Well, I'm very much in listening mode. I've started a wider consultation of this content within Network Rail um, because there are many gaps uh, in the work we've done so far. Are there many opportunities to develop this further so that it speaks to a full cross section of the industry? Please get in touch. I'm very much listening to ideas, listening to opinions, listening to views on how this uh, initiative can be useful and can be can speak volumes can mean, be meaningful to colleagues across the industry so I hope that's been uh, that's been a small insight into the work we're doing on trap technical strategy the working draft you've been a great working party thank you for that and I will now hand back to Liam thank you very much Gareth and thank you John Right, so that brings us on to our first Q&A session. Uh, so can I please remind uh, attendees that if, if you've got a question that you'd like to ask, uh, please use the, the, the question functionality box on the right-hand side of your screen. And uh, it would certainly help if you, um, uh, you put the name of the, the person who you're directing the, the question to, that would certainly help me. So uh, to start us off, we've had a couple of questions come in from uh, Andy Franklin. So uh, the first question is, is for you, Gareth. Uh, how do we, uh, sorry, well, I'll start the first one. I'm concerned that the current drive for personal safety is eroding system safety, particularly for S&C, where many assets are now never seen under traffic, which denies our engineers uh, important information on condition. How can a technical strategy address this? Great question, thanks Andy. I think that is at the heart of our challenge, of a lot of the research we're doing. So the requirements for the um, fixed monitoring systems that within our European research are very much targeted at replacing or understanding how we replace that uh, visual or tactile inspection of somebody on the ground um, makes it challenging because how much of the s do we instrument? We've got to understand the forces through the system, understand the most critical components and elements to, to monitor. Which is why I think it's a combination of both those fixed systems and the train-borne systems that we're now starting to uh, develop requirements for uh, and are very much part of our route services and asset information services teams um, strategy for increasing train-borne inspection and looking at the technology that's available globally to help us do this and not just within the rail industry so looking at technology transfer from other industries too so might I make a comment as well, leaping on to uh, Andy's question and Gareth's answer. Um, there's, there was a great piece of work uh, undertaken by Gareth and team ooh, a year, a couple of years ago, if you remember the bow ties, Gareth. So there's an opportunity for us to have a look at those bow ties and actually understand what those controls that we've got in place uh, and do we have the right risk measures and, and, and management systems to sort of identify when we get a more and better uh, remote monitoring systems in place, how do we remove the need for our people to be put in harm's way doing BVIs or other similar inspections? But I think it's fair to say it is a progress, a piece of work in progress, which is outlined by your strategy. Thanks, John. I think the other element of, of what we can consider is how we still have, uh, we, we, we give our inspectors tools so that they may be on the ground adjacent to an asset but in a place of safety but they have tools and equipment to conduct a level of inspection that allows them then to make a decision there and then whether they need to intervene any differently rather than relying on sort of uh, being sat in an office to and receiving data so i think there's a, there's a mixture of uh, of ways we can introduce new technology uh, and create a more uh, blended sort of transition from fully manual to something that is you know, blue sky completely automatic Brilliant. Okay, thank you both. Um, so moving on to uh, a question from Peter Halliwell. So um, 
the first is a comment to, to Gareth uh, for a draft proposal. Your strategy is, is well developed, detailed, balanced uh, for the track system, and it appears to sit well in the overall RTS. I'm not sure what that acronym is. It feels comprehensive and well founded. Uh, his question is. Uh, where are you with setting the measures for each element and baselining these setting uh, for targets in 2025 and 2040? Thanks, Peter. That's quite an easy answer for me at the moment, at the very, uh, very start of that journey. Um, so it's a great point. I'll take that away that how do we measure success? Uh, and that's something we will wrestle with over the coming weeks. But um, if you've got any ideas, like I say, I'm, I'm all ears because this is very much a, a, a consultative process. Okay, um, and we've got a question from Steve Featherston. So lots of good thinking from Gareth on the track technical strategy, possibly linked with John's theme. How do we increase the competency of the people implementing the technical strategy? We have often struggled with this in the past. So I, I can answer that, but or maybe Gareth would like to, because it's I, I think it's part of the competency framework and that's been rolled out, Gareth. Uh, John, I was, I was only going to say that behind um, some of that technology detail that I presented today, we're developing strategies for competency standards and assurance. And yeah, as you yeah. say, John, part of the competency strategy is um, taking our frameworks forward so that uh, not only are we rationalising what we have today and simplifying it and making it easy to engage with, but that we're looking ahead to see what capabilities we need to develop in the future. And that's yeah. very much part of kind of the iterative cycle for our frameworks. Yeah. I think if I can comment as well, I mean, frameworks aside, one of the great opportunities presented by uh, the reorganisation that we're all enjoying within Network Rail, and I'll put my Network Rail hat on here, um, is the, the strengthening of the engineering communities out in the regions. Uh, and I think it's all fair to say that there have been challenges in the past in that area. So one of the joys now, um, uh, Gareth in the um, chief track role, uh, uh, keeping the seat uh, hopefully as, as warm as possible for me, uh, will be working with the regional lead engineering reps. And that actually gives us a nice, very direct line link into each of the regions to support and make sure the right people are working on the right projects and getting the right outcomes. So it's all, all very positive. So next question, Liam, if we've got time. <laughs> Thanks, I think we've got time for one, one more quick one. Uh, I'll take it, this is actually a pre-submitted question from, from Stephen Barber, I think uh, John, it's for you. So in terms of accreditation and managing ongoing competence, to what extent do you see the PWI following an IRSE licensing model? So, yeah, thank you for, for that, Liam, and thank you, Stephen. Um, the, the view I have currently is um, I'm leaving that question open because I think we've got a number of steps to take in the coming year and indeed coming years to get us to a point where we may decide whether a licensing scheme is appropriate and correct. Um, I think it's possible. I think it could add value, but I think it'd be incorrect of me to say, yes, absolutely, in several months' time, we have a strategy to implement a licensing system for permanent way uh, individuals in the community. I think it really needs to be, what is the problem we're trying to fix? And I think it's that heart of making sure we've got a better, broader, clearer competency framework. There's loads of opportunities I've outlined in my slides. Um, I think it's entirely possible, but before we get to that point, I'd like us to make sure we've got a blended and well understood national framework stewarded, husbanded by the PWI, um, and then maybe a future president can consider whether that's the right thing to do. And that's me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, John and Gareth. So that, that brings our first Q&A uh, session to a close. There were a couple of unanswered questions that we didn't quite have time for uh, in that session. Uh, what I suggest is I'll work with Kate 
uh, afterwards to get uh, written answers from the presenters for you and then these will be sent out with with, with the minutes uh, and will be available on the PWI website. Fantastic. So, thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, John. So uh, then we're now moving on to the first of our project uh, specific uh, presentations. So I'd now like to introduce to you uh, Nick Matthews, Program Engineering Manager for the South Rail Systems Alliance. So Nick is a chartered engineer with 18 years of experience in track renewals. Uh, before joining the railway, Nick served 13 years in the RAF and spent two years at Honda. As Head of Transformation for the South Rail Systems Alliance, Nick is responsible for all aspects of continuous improvement, driving efficiencies, R&D, and the rolling out of innovations. Uh, in his career, Nick has developed progressive assurance methods for delivering right first time track handback, uh, which led to the UK first 125 mile an hour handback of SNC to traffic. Uh, Nick is also successfully leading uh, several R&D innovations, including induction welding. So, Nick, with that, uh, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Liam. I'm assuming everybody um, can hear me OK. And um, thanks so much for the invite to present on the work um, the South Rail System Alliance has been doing on decarbonisation. Okay, so but one of the challenges is, um, and I think uh, the picture paints a thousand words, is we're heavily, in fact, solely reliant on diesel and petrol power on our work sites to provide us energy. And um, as you can see, the uh, picture shows it all. Uh, we are causing a massive amount of pollution and we're not sustainable at all. Um, Coupled to that, we also create an awful lot of noise. So it's not just about carbon emissions, it's about emissions in general dust, um, toxic emissions, um, obviously a lot of our work sites are in town centres, next to schools, and we're pumping out lots and lots of toxic emissions. Uh, and again, all, all this sort of equipment as well, it does rely, uh, it takes an awful lot of maintenance, uh, hands-on maintenance as well, um, which, which costs money and again, um, brings down the availability of this equipment. And also that we have the logistics of getting the fuel to site, or the, the cost, the cost of doing that, but more importantly, the amount of spills and stuff we have around that. So we, we as the Alliance, we wanted to do um, something about that. Um, and that's why I'm going to show you some of our solutions to date. So what needs to be changed? So um, I think most of the people looking at those will recognise those tools. Each one of those tools or each that generator, they all have one thing in common, and that's the internal combustion engine and that burns fossil fuel, creates noise, creates fumes, and all the sort of things we don't want to do. And every time we burn a bit of fuel, that is that is fuel which is never going to be replaced, it's unsustainable. So we need to find a way, we need to move forward. So what 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 why what the reasons being given to me why we shouldn't change? Well first of all there's the UK weather. Um, you know the UK weather doesn't allow for things like solar power and all this sort of stuff. Um, I've been told that the equipment commercially available is just too big for inner city work sites. There's always the um, element of it's too expensive. Um, the classic is solar panel does not work at night. And also um, basically the British winter as well. We have very short days as we're aware, it's getting darker now in the mornings. And also there's people's just general attitude. And I think Homer sums it up rather nicely there. And that is um, trying is always the first step towards failure. So let's just keep doing what we're doing so we know it works. So um, what, 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 what avenue did the um, South Rail System Alliance go down to try and tackle some of these things? So the first thing we looked at was, well, can we use solar power? Um, obviously the sun doesn't shine all day, it doesn't shine at um, night time and stuff like that. What can we do? Um, so we looked at um, solar harvesting. So Pretty much we use um, solar irradiance or solar radiation through PV, PV panels. Um, and these basically charge our batteries. So we're, we're harvesting the sun's power rather than using it directly. So that then allows us to either use it directly through an inverter and power our loads or actually store it in a battery and then um, spread that demand across the day. So that's uh, one of the um, approaches we took. That's working very well. But equally, more importantly, is do we need the amount of power 
we currently generate. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. So we had to look at our welfare cabins. So we made sure that, that, that we insulate them all. When the doors are wide open, we turn the heaters off. Um, the lighting, we, we basically simply put in an infrared sensor. So if there's movement, yet yeah, the light's on. Um, if there's no movement, the lights go off. We also move to things like LED low energy bulbs. Um, but regardless of all these things we do, we still need to, um, we still have peaks in demand, such as when the dry room turns on or the um, someone puts the kettle on. So we can employ technology there to smooth demand and turn off non-critical devices to power the critical devices, such as the um, site controllers, computers and stuff like that. So we also manage our energy levels. And uh, the big one as well is energy efficient appliances. So rather than having just the, um, the resistance based electrical heater on the wall, we're looking at um, better systems such as heat pumps, which has the um, added benefit of also giving us air conditioning as well as heating. So there are some actual real bonuses to this stuff as well. So we've done an awful lot of work around that. Uh, so some of the solutions we come up with, and this is not a complete list, but it's a work in progress. So we've um, moved from um, uh, diesel powered tower lighting and link lighting to battery and solar powered link lighting to illuminate our sites. Um, we run absolutely successfully all year round and absolutely silent and fuel free. Um, we looked at the P-Way tool, so there's a couple of examples there. We've got the Robel bandsaw, which um, I'll talk about a little bit later, which has beautifully replaced the disc saw. Um, we got rid of bances by replacing them with um, battery powered torque guns, such as the high torque. Um, we're taking our dust suppression units. We made those battery powered. Um, we CCTV and site security, solar powered. And also we've got solar power generators, the list could go on, but also it's some of the other things, um, removing waste to landfill. So reusable water bottles, reusable cups. There's lots and lots of stuff doing there. So I'm just going to show you a video. Um, Katie, if you could take up the video, that'd be great, about uh, one site we did in Gloucester last year. So at Gloucester, we're renewing the switch and crossing units just at the west end of the station. We're renewing six units and we're refurbishing two units. And the purpose of that is to extend the life of the track. At this site, we're trying really hard to use as little diesel fuel as possible. We have been very, very keen on our sustainability. So like for instance, we, we're trying to ensure that we run a site that is um, diesel free. Our lighting systems, for instance, is a combination of um, battery and um, solar system. We've had all our link lighting powered by batteries. Pro Electric have been working in collaboration with um, the SNC South Alliance to um, use battery powered and solar powered link lighting to reduce diesel usage and emissions on site. We've got the Pro Track link lighting. The usual setup is nine link lights to one battery, and each battery will last for 16 hours each. Solar powered um, RXM tower light, which is the new product, which is slightly smaller than a, the standard BT1 tower light, but is run solely off a solar. All our combo lighting by solar and our generation in the compound area by solar as well. And we've got the solar tainer which powers the, all the cabins as well and the, and the food van. We've got solar powered systems for reminding people to shut the gates around the site and we're using battery powered tools. And the purpose of all that is to reduce the carbon footprint but also to reduce the noise levels on site and it also reduces the disturbance to our line side neighbours. And at this station, it's also open to passengers during some of the work, so it's also less disruptive for passengers and station staff. Vast majority, if not all of our um, small tools, for instance, are battery powered. Obviously, we've got battery drills, uh, like I said, battery chambres for drilling the rail. Personally, I find it a lot better with, like I said, we're using battery chambres, so we're not having to carry fuel, we're not having to deal with fuel, so it's got that hazard out for us as well. The SNC South Alliance are working in collaboration with OnTrack to reduce the amount of paper we have used on our sites. We're using an electronic safeware pack which includes permits and task briefs. We're working closely with OnTrack to improve the app to make things better and easier for all our costs to use on site. A system which is known as a dust suppression system. Originally this was introduced to us using generators to power the system. 
but due to our sustainability drive we ensure that this system is converted from generator to battery powered. It's just one of the things we're doing to um, continue to improve in our sustainability and looking after the environment. And another example is this bottle in my hand. It's something that is given out to everybody that signs onto the site and this is to ensure that we reduce our, um, the use of plastic bottles or plastic cups on site. So we've got um, water stations at several locations across the site. We reduce the amount of plastic that is being thrown back into the environment. far less diesel so our carbon footprint has been much lower for this work than it would have been the way we used to do things. We're not completely fuel free but we're trying to get there and we're very proud of the steps that we've made. We've used loads of battery and solar power and we've also managed to get everybody using reusable drinks containers which has reduced the single use plastic we've had to take away from sites. Um, thanks, Kate. Okay. Um, I, I personally couldn't hear the sound, so um, hopefully people were able to follow that using the um, the um, subtitles. So that that's some of the work we did at Gloucester, and that work's continuing on, and we've done plenty of other sites since then. Um, so just um, a few of the benefits of what we achieved at Gloucester was obviously sustainable. Um, our work sites, um, apart from obviously the RRVs and stuff like that zero noise emitted, um, zero emissions of CO2 and um, from carbon dioxide, um, very low little maintenance or zero maintenance that once you pull the panels out, off they run and no refueling. And um, one of the big benefits of Gloucester in particular, next to Gloucester station is, is Headway, which is a charity, a mental health charity, which deals with brain injuries. And they have, um, they have a site right off the platform at Gloucester Station. They were, they, were, they were concerned about the welfare of their patients while we were working at Gloucester. Um, so apart, apart from the project manager and the team, went to Headway, showed them what they was do, we was doing. Um, we removed some of the noisier activities of the renewals, such as when we was um, scrapping out and digging to the daytime, so it was less impact. And they was absolutely delighted um, with us, um, how we performed and basically kept all the noise emissions under control. Um, and fundamentally, some of the savings made to date, um, we, we've estimated we've saved over half a million kilograms of CO2 being emitted to the environment. And bearing in mind, this is just one alliance at Bristol. Um, we estimate we saved the best part of 189,000 litres of diesel. Um, that's based on if we were using the same sort of tower lights, um, which come traditional, traditionally come from, and the consumption taken from their technical manuals. That's how much fuel we would have saved. And basically that's the saving of the best part of um, 210,000 pounds on fuel cost and manpower refueling. So we're quite, we're quite happy with those savings and there's more work to be done. And again, this is just one depot in the UK doing this. Uh, so continuous improvement. Um, I mentioned earlier that some of the guys weren't happy with the size of some of the stuff. So the first thing we looked at was a solar container, which is basically uh, it's a 20 kilowatt generator effectively running by solar power and being harvest. As you see it's on the container. So once this is dropped off by a big ISO, it's pretty much stuck where it is. So working with one of our partners, Pro Electric, um, if Kate would like to just play the pro um, power video, we've now made this road transportable beyond sort of like a Hilux and it's exactly the same power output and can be moved anywhere on the site quite freely. So this is the latest development. Uh, I'll, I'll unmute myself and uh, talk through it. So literally we, we, we towed the site uh, we, could, we could deploy it wherever we like within the um, site access compound. 
Um, always make sure we're facing um, towards the sun, which obviously get the panels pointing to the south to get optimum solar performance. And literally the whole thing unpacks, as you can see. And with the batteries on board and so the power, we, we can provide a, a pretty much a constant 20 kilowatts of energy supply. Um, the, the other thing people have been using this for, or could use it for, is we've got an RRV there, that's our, an excavator. But um, with the move into EV vehicles, you could also plug your EV vehicle in, in, on site into this and it'll charge your EVs for you. Um, again, the, the tower light. Um, so the original tower light from Pro Electric, one of our suppliers, had basically four panels going out sideways. So this made it almost practically impossible to put it down the side of the railway. So um, the um, Ryan Ballinger uh, and Ian Morgan from Bristol went to Pro Electric and said, no, we need something different. So they worked together and they came up with the RXM tower light, which um, if Kate can cue the video, we'll show you that. So rather than the panels going out sideways, we made the panels go upwards and we just used higher power panels which effectively gave us, a, sorry, uh, we, we, we used, um, obviously solar power as a panel of moving forward. So with a bit of an increase in output, we was able to go from four panels to three panels and stack them vertically. So this now sits quite nicely in most, most cesses. All this technology is digitally linked back to um, a control center. So we can turn the lights on and off as we choose, or we can set it on PRR sensors. We can change the light intensity. So it's just a very low illumination for a low illuminating size. But as you get closer, it goes up to full power to get some local lighting. So yeah, so that's some of the developments we've done just to bring this technology down to a railway deployable size. Thanks, Kate. Uh, and we've done pretty much the same with the battery tool. Um, we, we basically looked at the, the common major P-Way tools and working with our suppliers such as Chambray, Robel, also our plant suppliers, Torrent, Sunbell, Speedy, all those sort of things. We've been trying to find battery equivalent tools or so petrol tools. And I, I'm, very, I'm very encouraged with what's out there at the moment in time. In some cases, the petrol tool is still the better tool. Um, I'll give you the example of the vertical Robel tamper. Um, both tools will do absolutely identical job, but you've got probably about a 20 minute battery life with the battery um, Robel vertical tamper. However, stress impacts now run quite happily on batteries. All our drills run quite happily on batteries. And the one I'm particularly pleased with is the Robel bandsaw, because uh, this one really does prove um, that that battery is as good as petrol. So um, hopefully um, there's a short video here which will actually prove that for any doubters. So Katie, if you could cue the video, please. So I, as you see, um, this is a little sidings. I have a band saw and I have a disc saw. And we'll have a little, little bit of a race here. See, see who, who wins. Uh, it's a shame there's no sound, but uh, all the sound you could hear is the disc saw, the uh, band saw is absolutely silent. Um, the operator doing the disc saw, uh, he's suffering from HABs, so he's got hand on vibrations. The operator of the band saw has zero HABs. So all he has to do is slowly turn that handle. And we're even looking at automating that. The, um, the, the disc, as most of us all know on this call, one disc will probably last you a cut and a half, two cuts if you're lucky. 
um, the, the blade and the bandsaw will give up to about 50 cuts uh, and the battery life that will last you quite comfortably an entire eight hour shift if not more. That's quite a common feature and the, this saw the um, guard gets stuck and um, someone has to do a manual intervention. You also notice it's um, far safer for the operator because they're not, they're not having to wear as much PPE because there's no sparks or this, um, bits of metal flying around. So that's it, that's Hi, the band so we're done. Nick, sorry, it may just be worth turning off your video because some people are just commenting that your, your, your audio is dropping out slightly. Okay, then. Anyway, that, that's the um, video done. Um, so just back to the presentation. So that, that was just a good example of um, how battery tools are pretty much the equivalent to their petrol counterpart. And in, um, in, I honestly believe in the case of the disc or better because you saw the accuracy of the cut. Um, you can literally cut a millimetre sliver off the end of the rail with the um, bandsaw. That's how accurate it is. Sorry, I, can't. I don't seem to be able to go through my app. Thank you. Uh, and then to finally to close up, um, we've got other developments in, in the pipeline on the um, on the South Rail System Alliance. So we've looked at uh, making um, solar powered CCTV, which has been successful. Um, we come up with a system called Gate Guardian, which um, basically is a solar panel CCTV. But as you approach the gate, not only it records the people approaching the gate, but it also gives people a friendly reminder to actually lock and secure the access point behind them. And if they don't, we have some video evidence where we're going to have a nice friendly behavioural conversation with them to understand why they felt that they didn't need to lock and, lock and secure an access gate. So that's um, particularly pretty pleased with that one. Um, we, we've, developed, we've developed a set of um, system requirements. So if you want to provide welfare to our sites, um, this is what we expect. And it talks about things like insulated cabins, um, low energy appliances, all sort of good stuff to keep that power demand down. Um, I would like to be discussing with the R&D board, um, Malcolm Miles and Gareth at their, their, their joint board about how, how can we um, take our, our heavy plants of our Kirovs, our RRVs, and start moving them towards maybe a hydrogen fuel cell or something like that. So maybe there's the case for some network rail R&D funding to do that forward because although we've got the welfare going, we're still, still burning loads and loads of diesel using heavy plants and sites. Um, we've been, we, yeah, we won an international award for our work. We've got the Green Apple Award, which we're particularly proud of. And um, also moving forward, we're looking now, we're starting now to look at EV fleets and charging points. So uh, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. So um, thanks very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, I'll hand you back to Liam, and I'm more than happy to take your questions and answers at my at the appropriate junction. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, Nick, there was just a few comments from uh, audience members. Uh, so just to confirm that you're you're happy to share all of those videos uh, or links to the videos with with the uh, the meeting minutes. Okay, so uh, that brings us on to uh, our next presentation. So I'd now like to introduce to you uh, Tony Morgani and Stuart Witz from Jay Murphy and Sons. So to start with, Tony Morgani, he joined uh, Carillion as it was as a trapman 16 years ago. Uh, he's held various roles in, in maintenance, works delivery, and is now working alongside capital delivery with Jay Murphy and Sons. He's a registered engineering technician with the PWI and ICE. And he's currently the engineering manager for working on the track interface across earthwork and drainage, HS2, civil asset management, utilities, power and properties. 
Uh, and uh, with Tony today is Stuart. So Stuart uh, Witts, he joined RailTrack as a civil engineer in 2002. He's held various roles within network rail uh, in asset management and project delivery. He joined Murphy's in 2012. Uh, he's currently the senior engineering manager overseeing Earthworks and drainage renewals portfolio alongside uh, capital delivery teams. Uh, Stuart is a chartered engineer uh, with the ICE and he's a member of the PWI. Uh, so Stuart and Tony, uh, over to you two. Thank you. Thanks, Liam. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation um, on best practice in capital delivery. Uh, our presentation is titled 100 foot under to 10 foot above. I'll just check to see if I've got control. Um, I think someone's to... It looks like you've got, con oh, hold on, here we go. Right, there we go, brilliant. Yep, 100 foot under to 10 feet above. And the reasons for that will become clear um, as we progress. Um, we were hoping to open the presentation with a poll. Uh, Kate, are we able to put that up? Brilliant. So the question we wanted to pose to everybody was, um, what was the biggest challenge on your most recent big project or task? So the options we've put up there, uh, lack of clarity on the requirements or the scope, or indeed creep in that scope, insufficient funding available to complete the task, insufficient time to complete the task or the project properly, um, not having correct or appropriate skill set within your team, or lack of key data or information. So we'll, we'll let that one run for a few seconds and then see how that one pans out. few more seconds. Okay, did we have any results to show from that one, Kate? Okay, good. So, quite clear leader there, but what we'll do, we'll come back to that um, in our summary. So, Let's get on the way. Slide seems to be taking its time to change for me. I'm sure it'll jump forward about four slides at a time in a moment. Or just disappear. <laughs> okay, brilliant. So our presentation is divided into two sections. Uh, the first, we'll look at a, a scheme hardly cut in phase two works. Um, it's taking place near Leamington Spa in Warwickshire. It's a major renewal um, to a pro problematic deep cutting. Uh, which is around 34 metres deep and forms the 100 foot under element of the presentation. Secondly, uh, Stuart will talk through the leads of Port Canal underbridge reconstruction, which is up near Accrington in Lancashire. That's a replacement of a railway underbridge in a tricky location, so that'll be your, your 10 foot above. And then at the end, we'll, we'll summarise and, and take any questions. Okay, so. Harbury Cutting it was originally constructed in 1847, completed in 1852 as part of the main line between Oxford and Birmingham. Um, the railway through this section was uh, designed and built by Brunel. And at the time, it was the largest handle cutting of the world, as we said, over 34 metres in depth. Uh, the tunnel itself was originally planned to be a lot longer. There were a number of issues with the ground and stability, uh, as we, we later found out which led to the cut being left open with only a very short section of tunnel being constructed. Um, the tunnel then divides the cutting into an east and west section. Back in 2015, some of you will probably know, there was a large failure um, of the west cutting, which resulted in the line being closed for six weeks, causing major disruption um, 
British line carries, it says there, to 80 passenger trains and 50 freight trains every day. Just open for the slide, there we go. So we can see from the aerial photograph there, the railway is sort of running from the top left to the bottom right of your screen. That's running from uh, Leamington to, oh, sorry. I don't know if you can, slide seems to have changed on me. There we go. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the, the previous earthwork undertaken in 2015. It was around 326,000 tonnes of earth moved there, just to give you a bit of indication of scale. Uh, the cut in itself is about 160 metres linear from, from the main road here to Boring Farm Old Bridge. And to the right of the main road is the Harbury Phase 2 area that we'll be talking about. And just under the road, there's a short length of tunnel. Uh, probably major differences between the west, the previous west scheme, and the new one on the east is that we've obviously got this, this bit of industrial um, land here, whereas here it was mainly agricultural. So this is another, another challenge we've got on this side. General overview of the works. So on the left of your screen in the in the lovely kind of cyan colour is the, the, the tunnel portal there. The, the dots within that are representative of, of soil nails. You can see the, the railway running straight across the screen there. And this, this is our regrade screen, uh, scheme. So each colour represents a slightly different grade. This red hatched area, you can just make out here, I'm tracking with the cursor, is a, is a failure site, a slip site. Uh, we've got some drainage detail running perpendicular to the track here, form a sort of counterfort type thing. Along the crest of the embankment in the red is a contiguous pile wall to sort of retain the land back here with the industrial units on them. Very good. So in terms of the soil nailing, over 660 soil nails to be installed in total. Um, the majority of these are six metres in length, um, decreasing in length the nearer to the crest they get. As you can see on the, the drawing on the right there, with some short nails at the top, and you fall six metres in length above the tunnel portal. Um, in terms of installing these, we've used a long reach excavator where possible. Um, safety point of view, so in the upper slope, we're using the long reach to put the nails in. You can just about make out on the diagram here. There's uh, a catch fence which has been installed to allow us to work daytime, normal operations of the train below. Uh, temporary crest access system was installed uh, using sacrificial nails and wire ropes to allow A frame working. Currently, we're around halfway through, about 300 nails installed. So, there's some pictures just illustrating what I was saying there. So, you can, this is the, the main road area here. You've got the uh, catch fence there just over the tunnel portal. And you can see the rig being used there to install soil nails. Uh, on the picture on the right, you can see the rig again to the left of the temporary access steps. And then you can see the long reach installing the, uh, the soil nails in the upper slope there. In terms of the regrade itself, this drawing is quite good because you can See the, the sleeper in the track down here, so it kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the thing. So the black dotted line that hopefully you can see my cursor tracking along there is the existing ground profile with the blue and red lines showing you the, the proposed. So we're taking weight off that embankment, slackening the grade off to improve the factor of safety. Um, got a bit of a burn installed there again. Uh, in future, that'll allow access for inspection of the, the slope. Um, you've got your, your pile in detail up the top in red with a pile cap on the top and, and the access road that's retained by that there. So for the slope regrade, um, we adopted uh, like a hay baling daisy chain type arrangement using multiple machines. So you can, you can sort of see the machines drawn in there with their working radiuses illustrated by the, the circles around them. So you've got the big machines at the top sort of medium on the mid berm and, and down at the lower berm, the smaller plant. So this is just showing that they can like, pass material from one to the other to the other to the top where it'll be taken away. 
another picture there. So again, you can you can see the machines sort of working as we've, we've said there. We've got quite small machines on these lower slopes. We've got the machine on the mid burn there to pass up to the, the bigger boys up the top there, where they'll load up and the muck will be taken away or, or stored as necessary. Um, extensive deveg works going on on the slope as well. Whereas this this bit of uh, vegetation sort of in the centre of the screen there has been left as as a screen. To the, to the trains, obviously the, the tunnel's kind of in the, the centre bottom of the slide as we look at it. So the train driver will be coming out the tunnel um, in terms of his heart health um, and other things. We don't really want him coming out the tunnel and, and seeing all this enormous plant on the side of the track there. Uh, also another catch fence detail there. Should, uh, should anyone or anything be in danger of, of encroaching on the operational railway? From the air, nice picture uh, you can see as we said the sort of scale of the site whereas the early slide showed you pre-works this is works very much underway again you can see that screen and vegetation there providing a nice mask as the vehicles come out of the tunnel you can see everything really from here you've got the soil nailing around the tunnel portal there yeah, your e-grades with the various berms as we've discussed and the industrial area at the top there In terms of the piling detail at the crest of the cutting, it's a contiguous pile wall. Um, there's quite a lot of piles in there. You're talking about 100, 190, 200 piles being installed in, in quite a tight area, really. Oh, there we go. So, um, Considerations practically we have with this site, we were using a, a Bauer BG30 piling rig, which is over 100 tonne in weight, um, approaching 27 metres in height when it's upright. The issues we had were with the, the grades on site, it could only travel on a 1 in 10 grade, um, and it needed a 1 in 30 grade to work, so even shallower. So the, the, you can see along the top there, the initial design for the piling platform was very up and down. We had a number of different grades going on. It was going to be difficult for the rig to be tracking and working. Um, far from ideal. So there's a final revision to that. You can probably just about make out along the top here. There's every fall all the way along the road is a one and 30. So at any position along that, that road, along that piling platform, the, the rig will be fine to work. Um, we went with a, a guide beam. Uh, to ensure that the piles were correctly spaced and um, correct verticality. Obviously, like I said, there's a lot of piles going in, in a relatively tight area. So um, any slight deviation in that is going to cause us problems. So there's a guide beam installed. Um, in terms of efficiency and all that good stuff, um, to be able to incorporate that guide beam wall into the finished pile cap will be a lot better than then having to break out the wall and, and recast something on the top. So. Um, there was a suggestion sent from ourselves to the designer for how this might work. You can make out the attached area here being the, the guide beam. You've got your pile going through the center and, and the pile cap then suggested to be cast into the top with, with some connecting detail. Um, as you can see, a bit of humor, there was some minor comments returned from the designer. Um, yeah, if that's minor, I'd hate to see uh, the, the detailed major ones. So that was taken into account and there's agreed uh, detail for the, the, the final pile cap. So again, guide beam, pile cap on the top, some slightly modified link details there. But that was uh, that was agreed, accepted. And um, you can see the guide beam under construction there. So you've got your formwork, your, um, your reinforcement. Um, and then, yeah, it's all backfilled. You can see these link details that we could see on the sketch. Just protruding there. Basically, you've got your rig here and it piles straight through the guide beam. So, as I said, the spacing is already pre set Verticality is as good as assured. Uh, just, it just means that things can move along quite quickly, quite nicely, and with a better quality. And, and there's a good picture of the rig working now on a, a lovely, typically British summer's day. <laughs> As you can make out in the background, you've got a two-story building there, which kind of just really puts into, into perspective the size of the rig we're using. 
Um, just, just uh, an interesting note, really. Uh, some of you may have seen it. It was publicised by the, the Permanent Way Institution and went out on social media as well. Um, that during the embankment regrade works, the, the team uncovered some in items of, of historical interest, uh, which were later identified as an old rail bogey axle set there, you can see, kind of on the back of the pickup. Uh, and also a length of rail, which was dated um, some, some time between 1870 and 1875, so a little bit older than what's in some parts of the network at the moment. Um, these items, they'd, they'd have been used to transport the materials to site and carry out any work to the tunnel portal during, during that period. Um, a curator from the National Railway Museum was contacted and, and came out to site obviously viewed these, identified them, and, and then expressed a desire to take them back to the museum so that everyone could have a look at them, which was, uh, which was good. So yeah, that, that takes me on nicely. Um, and I'd like to hand over to Stuart, who'll talk you through the, the scheme that forms the 10 foot above part of our talk. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, morning, everybody. Um, Stuart Witts. Um, yeah, we're going to head up now to the sunny northwest, so not quite on the scale of, of uh, the Harbury earthwork, but a lot of challenges with this uh, bridge reconstruction. So here we are up in uh, just near Accrington. Um, off to the left of the picture is the Blackburn direction, and off to the right of the picture is the Accrington and Burnley direction. The bridge that we were asked to reconstruct is in the centre there. Uh, you can see where the, the white circle is. It was spanning over the Leeds Liverpool Canal, and the railway consisted of uh, two tracks, non electrified, and the route is the Preston to Burnley and over onto Hebden Bridge route, uh, carries a mix of passenger and freight traffic. So, in terms of the existing bridge, so here it is, so nothing massively out of the ordinary, as I said, a relatively modest span. Um, clearly, paintwork, as you can see from the bottom right hand corner, is beginning to break down. Um, the other key driver as well was what they call the route availability. Some of you might be familiar with that, but if you're not, it, it relates to uh, the, the loading of, of trains that can be accommodated on the route. So freight and loco hold passenger, generally a higher route availability or RA rating. Um, it was getting to the point where potentially they might have to put a speed restriction on it. So um, onto the remit then. Um, so we're basically asked to design and build a, an underbridge reconstruction. Um, massive constraints on this site. So the original proposal was for a, for a fully ballasted UTEC, and we were thinking about a mobile crane. However, the reality is is that um, the uh, a lot of constraints in the bottom right-hand corner, a golf course uh, off to the right of the picture above the canal is a surface-laid UU main which we couldn't cross over top left hand corner of the screen and a historic landfill which we couldn't cross due to contaminated ground issues and uh, in the bottom left the land was entirely landlocked uh, by the motorway the canal and the railway uh, next slide please if i can't go on sorry excuse me for a second Sorry, Stuart, you'll have to bear yeah. with me. The PowerPoint has turned itself off, so just bear with us while we get back ah. to the slide. Sorry, no everybody. Problem. I thought it was me, Kate. But I'll perhaps, I'll perhaps carry on talking just because I, I'm conscious we've perhaps run out of time. So essentially, um, the uh, we had to look at the problem a little bit differently from what from where we would normally look at it. Um, so traditionally, we, as I said, we'd think of, of mobile crane or even driving a bridge in or out with a, um, oh yeah, we're back up and running again, um, with a, uh, a multi-axle multi transporter. So you might have seen this on previous projects where we basically uh, have transport units which can drive bridges in or out. Obviously in this case, it wouldn't be appropriate so we had to think a bit differently so we started thinking about what could we do using rail based plant only which in civils terms is quite tricky just due to lifting capability um, so um, before we kind of jump onto the bridge itself we also had to think think about a satellite compound as well um, so this is just thinking about um, where we could actually get uh, vehicles to where we could have a lay down area 
uh, where we could have a wrap because the existing bridge location just couldn't accommodate any of that. Uh, just next slide, please. Wrong, sorry. Few technical problems, I do apologize. So yeah, so this is coming on to the next slide now. So we had to basically start with, with the end in mind. So how do we reverse engineer the bridge in order to um, uh, basically uh, accommodate the lifting capability of, of rail plant? So we looked at the Kirov cranes, uh, rail-based crane, to see what it could lift. And then we designed individual components and units to basically suit that Kirov crane. Um, it ended up basically dividing into two um, weathering steel decks with around 20 precast uh, components, which could then be lifted. Um, so that's a lot of lifts uh, from our point of view, probably more than we would normally accommodate with, um, but we just had to work with that based on the constraints of the site. So this is the, the design we came up with. It was a composite deck type and the precast units would have to be uh, connected using shear studs into the underlying steel deck. Um, so just um, uh, briefly on the temporary works, um, yeah, there, there's some cons concerns that the embankments might, uh, that the abutments, sorry, might start to uh, rotate once the existing bridge deck had been removed. And this was compounded by the fact that the Kirovs uh, impose a significant loading surcharge on the rear of the abutments. So we ended up having to do significant temporary works to prop the abutments as well. So just to add complexity. Uh, I'll skip this slide just because we're, we're running short on time. So the, the Kirov cranes, um, many of you will be familiar with the Kirovs. Um, so uh, essentially they can they, they come as a, a, a hold by a locomotive uh, and then the locomotive detaches and then they propel under their own weight. Um, in consist mode or in, 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 in transit, they're a relatively modest RA rating, but as soon as you start lifting with them, they impose significant loads on the, the track and the uh, embankments underneath. So here come the main blockade. And it's interesting that we obviously had the fire alarm and, and John Edgley's comment that you have to, to kind of plan for the unexpected. Well, our, our unexpected was Storm Dennis. Um, that hit us in the middle of the nine day blockade. Um, we had a mobile crane at the compound and that was very heavily impacted. You can just about see in the center of the picture uh, the, the mobile crane there in the compound location, the bridge being just off the bottom of the picture. The Kirov crane actually was much less impacted due to its much lower boom height and its overall much more, stability, uh, much more stable uh, lifting operation. So instead of lifting the units on at the compound with the mobile crane, we actually ended up lifting the uh, units on with the Kirov crane at the compound location. So just dropping down now to some of the uh, main works. Uh, here we go, we can see the old bridge coming back out again. Um, here is uh, the Kirov crane sat um, just off the end of the abutment. As you can see, that, that kind of illustrates the proximity of the Kirov crane to the abutments and therefore the surcharge loading that we're talking about and the, and the propping in the center of the picture is resisting some of that load um, to make sure the whole structure remains stable. Just wrapping up them with uh, a couple of final pictures. Um, here you can see the new bridge deck going in. So that's the first of the two bridge decks. Uh, you can see um, the uh, access arrangements in that slide as well. Um, and then this is the second bridge deck going on as well. Um, just to kind of wrap up the presentation, a final thought. So just returning to that, um, the poll, I think, I think it won out with the scope um has been the uh, one of the most prominent factors um i think you know tony and i basically from this presentation wanted to illustrate that all of those factors come into successful project delivery so having the right budget the right skill set in the team a very clear scope and a very clear remit to work to uh, and, and and having the money in place to to deliver that effectively and, and safely so uh, that's it from me sorry we had to go a little bit quicker there but i think we're just a little bit short on time and uh Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you uh, very much, Stuart. Stuart, that was uh, seamlessly handled despite the, the technical difficulties you had there, so that was brilliant. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'd like to now uh, invite Nick, Matthews, uh, Tony and Stuart back for a 10-minute Q&A session. So this is the second Q&A session of today. So can I please remind attendees to use the question function on the right hand side of your screen and again it would be helpful if you could direct your question to the name of the person that, that you wish to ask the question of. So uh, start, I'll start off Nick, there's, uh, there's been quite a buzz um, on based on your presentation so I'm going to wrap a few sort of similar questions into, into one really. So, so the question is around the, the, the cost difference for the, the, the plant that you presented today versus the you know standard uh, tools we might use and uh, as well as cost is there any um, uh, are all these products available now or are they still uh, yeah, are they off the shelf or are they still under kind of trial and development so uh, yeah Liam, yeah absolutely so I'll make no bones about it this equipment is more expensive than than its diesel counterparts why is that it's new it's novel so obviously the companies developing need to get their costs back in selling these products however if we took a tower light yes i can hire a um a conventional diesel tower light maybe for 200 pounds a week and the um, solar equipment is 400 pounds a week however after about two or three days of running a diesel tower light i need to keep refueling it and it's only about seven days into it when actually the difference between the solar light and the these are like you get your break even point. So you've got a work site established for much more than a week, two weeks, which in many cases we do, it's solar all the way. Um, and that, that, that then leads, leads to the, the, the bigger point is the more we order, the more we ask for this stuff, the more the cost comes down. It's like anything. If we buy one item, we pay a big sum of money for it. We buy a hundred items, then there's an economy in scale. So it's one of these things in time yes the cost will come down um again the other the other big problem we have is as well is our plant suppliers they have full inventories of diesel lights i understand that and you know all of a sudden they're not going to be able to turn those off overnight excuse the pun i didn't mean to go out that way and give us solar overnight so there's got to be a, a sort of gradual swap over the two technologies and one of the things we've done in the South Rail System Alliance to help that and also help our reliability, to be honest, as well, more as a driving factor is we, look, we say to our plant suppliers, actually, you need, need now any equipment over five years old, you really need to be giving us a good reason why you're providing us that equipment rather than a modern, reliable piece of equipment. So we're hoping that through the process of slowly changing the technology, we can make the changes required. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Nick. Okay, next question is from Kenneth Merrifield. It's a question for Stuart. So did you have any environmental issues with the temporary works restricting the river flow, uh, especially any control measures that had to be managed on site during the, the, the conditions of Storm Dennis? Um, yeah, good question. Um, it, was, it was a canal rather than a river, um, so we didn't necessarily uh, have huge problems with, with uh, water flow um the challenges from the storm were more around the winds um so that that was our primary um uh, problem that, that came out of that um obviously in terms of the wider site yes we're, we're you know environmental issues are always at the forefront aren't they um i must admit i, I don't know the specifics off the top in terms of the of the environmental uh, surveys but uh, it, very rarely a, a project passes where we don't uh, have have new controls or badger controls or, or some sort of um, mitigations that we have to put in place. But but purely in terms of the the river flow, uh, it, as I said, it was a canal, so we didn't have a huge additional uh, water coming across the site. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, okay, back to Nick. Um, it's a question around charging point. Uh, so this is from uh, Michael Ziedler. Uh, are there plans to install uh, charging points at the NR access points and sidings? Um, SP Rail have trialled electric vans and this would overcome staff range and, and anxiety in, in getting to site essentially. Um, yeah, um, hi Michael, hope you're well. Um, nice to hear from you. 
Yes, so charging points, um, particularly interesting. So Network Rail as an organisation, I know they have, um, it was launched only a couple of days ago, they have a strategy to uh, accelerate getting charging points out there. Um, I Clearly, I, only, I can only work quite tactically on the South Wales System of the Alliance. I can you know, use forums like this to um, preach a little bit. So from the South Wales System of Alliance point of view, what we're trying to do is at our depots is install EV charging points. So if I take Bristol Parkway, for example, um, we're just going through the process of landlord's consent to get eight EV charging points installed at Bristol Parkway depot. And also at the same time, I'm looking at getting solar panels on the roof to actually account for the extra energy we're using. Um, so yes, we are doing something, um, but also the biggest issue is our, is our fleets at the moment in time. So fixed depots and getting charging points there is a relatively easy, um, and I'd say that taking a deep breath because it's not easy at all, but compared to getting charging points out on site is a different point altogether. Um, but again, with the range of um, EV vehicles now getting 300, 400 miles, we're at the point now where actually, do we need to put that much infrastructure in at our depots where actually, you know, we don't, for example, have a petrol pump at our depots, we use external infrastructure. So I think it's a combination of putting a few points at the depots, which we're doing, but also, you know, when people are having company cars, company vans, we basically work with those people, get a charging point installed at their house. And, you know, with the apps and stuff available now, rather than building their home electricity bill, you can actually build directly for the app and pay for the electricity via the company. So there's other solutions out there. So it's a combination of a little bit, a few charging points at the depots, yes, absolutely, but also people using these vehicles, work with them where possible to actually install charging points at home and then use the existing infrastructure, which is only improving at motorway service stations and stuff like that. Brilliant. Thank you, Nick. Uh, just time for a couple more questions then. So uh, this one is for Tony. Uh, so this is from Andy Franklin. And the question is around the design life for the remedial works at Harbury uh, and uh, what inspection processes are in place to make sure the ongoing integrity of, of the installed treatments. Ah, yeah, Liam, thanks for that. Um, I might actually invite Stuart to give me a hand with this one, actually, as the CEM for the scheme. Yeah, I think I think design, design life we're generally um, generally working on on sixty years for for the slopes. Um, you know, the reality is we'd we'd get much longer than that. Um, uh, you know, we, we'd be we'd be looking at hundred years plus, but it's sixty years officially. Um, I think the second part of the question was around inspections and controls. Um, yeah, absolutely. Inspection is absolutely key to to managing earthworks effectively. I think as Tony touched on in his slides, um, we incorporated the the, berm, the lower berm feature there to allow for easy future access. And we also incorporate um, access steps down the uh, face of the tunnel portal um, to allow for, for inspection of the portal area as well. And, and those steps ex extend all the way right around the, the sides of that curved portal area. So, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, inspection and examination, absolutely key to, to future maintenance of that. And, and that replicates what was done on the Western side as well, where we tried to incorporate um, good future access for, for, for easy inspection by the earthworks examiners. Uh, ho hope that answers the question. Thanks, Stu. Thank Thanks, thanks, Tony. Thanks, Stu. I think we've got time for one quick one. Uh, so I get back to Nick. Um, so uh, comment from David Underwood. Uh, really pleased with the sustainable innovation. Uh, I think it's more about staff here. Uh, how difficult is it get is it getting the staff on board to adopt it and, and make these BAU activities? Well, it's not. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Um, it's not that particularly awkward. If, for example, the Robel bandsaw, if it's as good or better than the petrol equivalent, the staff are absolutely delighted to use it. Um, however, if the the item you're trying to introduce is more difficult to use than its petrol counterpart then you're naturally going to um find, find some resistance quite and to be honest quite rightly so um, people have enough to worry about without having to adapt to different methods so the important thing for me is that whatever we 
present to the team is first of all we work with the team so they help us choose the tools and develop the tool but it, it, it does make their life and fundamentally easier and the Robel bandsaw makes their life easier um, the the chambray drill um, unfortunately the sound was off on my video but you can see the s t guys absolutely delighted using the battery drill because it was easier for them so the, the main thing is is yes not only does it um, need to be sustainable and battery powered or those sort of things but it's got to be at least as good if not better than what's what pre-existed Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. So this thanks to Nick, uh, Tony and Stuart. Uh, so that, that brings us to the end of the Q&A session. So um, we've now reached, well, we're coming up to the halfway point of the conference now. So at this point, we're going to take a 15 minute break. So please take the time to stretch your legs, grab a cup, a cup of coffee, and we will be reconvening at 11 a.m. Speak to you all soon.
Okay, good morning everybody uh, and welcome back to part two of the Network Rail Trapreneurs Engineering Conference which is being supported by the PWI. Um, so I, now it's my... I can just make sure we're all on mute please. Thank you. So it's now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, Amit uh, and James from the Central Rail Systems Alliance. So um, to start with, Amit, uh, Amit began his career in the rail industry as a data analyst uh, 14 years ago. And throughout this time, he's acquired two MSCs in business improvement and e-commerce. Uh, he's become a specialist in Six Sigma and has used this expertise in a variety of roles, including as program manager for the SNC Alliance Track Reliability Program, where he improved post-installation asset reliability by 60%. Amit is now the head of innovation for the Central Rail Systems Alliance, and he's passionate about improving processes and introducing digital innovation. I'd also like to introduce James Murray. James is Ops Director for the Central Rail Systems Alliance on Northwestern Central, he representing Balfour Beatty. He was previously the Plain Line Director for Amy uh, in the previous control, control period. Uh, James has over 20 years experience in the rail sector, working in maintenance, track rentals, HS1 and major projects. So with that, Amit and James, you should now have control over to you. Brilliant, thanks Liam. Um, I'll just flick on to the next slide. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, Project Heineken uh, and then James will come in and talk about the Kilby Tunnel blockade that we delivered. So in terms of Project Heineken, I'll give you a, a bit of background as to, as to um, the challenges that we faced uh, moving into a devolved world. We'll talk about what Project Heineken is. I've got a live demonstration of what the tool looks like. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a trial that we had um, at North Wembley where we pulled all the the, the, the stages together to demonstrate the value and, and demonstrate that, that the tool can actually work and then share with you some of the, the, the feedback that we had from the key stakeholders. So if I move on, some of the, over the last year within Network Rail, most of you will be aware that we, from a, a track renewals perspective, have, have devolved into um, regions and then routes. So on the right hand side, the colours represent the, the regions that we work in and, and, and the Central Alliance obviously look after the green and the orange, the Northwestern Central and LNE routes. And some of the challenges that, that we, were, we were looking to face is, you know, as working in capital delivery, where we'll be kind of up against others to try and get access. So, you know, access is key. Um, and as we're devolved into the routes, it, it would become even uh, more difficult and challenging to try and get access. So one of the one of the, the the challenges that we were set as we were devolving into the route is how can you maximise the access that you've got from a track perspective? What can we do differently, and how can we actually work in this new world as a devolved world, close to the maintainer, close to the signalling teams, and works delivery? And therefore, the, the, the team went away taking into consideration that actually we still needed to put passengers first. So the answer wasn't, let's just have more access. Um, it's, it's actually, how do we utilize the access that we had? And off the back of that is where really Project Heineken was, was born. In that, um, you know, you're all probably thinking now, Project Heineken, is that a beer? Well, yes, it actually is. Um, and, and for those of you who've been around uh, in the 80s, will remember the advert where um, there was a company digging up a hole uh, on, on the roads. Um, and the company did the, the renewal or, or, or dug up the hole, renewed the, 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 the cables that were needed to be done and then disappeared. But then the day after, another company came in and did the same and they, and they put the gas pipes in and they, they did their piece of work and then they disappeared off. And then the water, water team came in and, and, and they did the same. So we, off the back of that, the reason why it's called Heineken is, is we do that in, in the rail industry. If you think about the access that we book, track will come in, do, do book the access, do their work. And then a couple of weeks later, maintenance may come in, book some access and, and do their work. So, you know, th we need to change that, that kind of philosophy. So, so by looking at how we can try to, to maxi maximize the access, we, we thought about developing a tool that would actually visualize uh, the work and the renewals that are taking place on that patch. And that's what you see in front of you. Um, this is a visual representation 
of a, a job that we've got near Cheadle. And the, the red line that you see is the possession um, that we would have from a track renewal. The yellow dots are the maintenance activities. And in this case, you'll see that it's a, a signage maintenance that need to be done in that area. And what we also try to do is include um, the, the, the blue dots represent the customer relation. So this is where people ringing up Network Rail saying, oh, you know, the, the trees are overgrown or, or this scrap still left. Can you help us clear this out? And what we've been able to do is combine those data sets um, and, and display them on a map. So, so we can see far enough out some of the challenges and issues that we can help resolve while we're using that access. And the next slide just shows kind of the data that, that, that is captured. So we're using planning data that we've got within P6, maintenance ellipse data, and customer relationship data, which is coming live from the, the, the databases that we use. It's combining those efforts, and, and that is what is represented on the map that you see. What we're looking to do um, going forward is also to include the, the signaling possessions that we have um, that come out of PPS. But more importantly, we've got to think more like a business now. You know, um, last year on our route, do we know how much money we have spent in Schedule 4 payments? And, and the plan here now is to, is to look back historically, map that data across the network to actually identify where are we spending money um, and then look at our renewals and, and collate the two. Hopefully they should match, but this is a tool that allows us to do that very easily. On the left hand side at the bottom, you've just got kind of the time frames in terms of T minus stages. So what we're looking to do in terms of overview, agree the work with the maintenance teams then actually start to implement some of that change all the way down to T minus zero. I'm now moving on to the next slide. So I don't know if we can put the video on, okay, in terms of the mapping tool. So this is this is just to give you a flavor of, of what the tool actually looks like and some of the functionalities that are along with it. We've created a, a how-to video. So this is um, kind of showing you um, how the tool works. Basically on the left hand side, you've got um, the, the panels, uh, you can filter uh, by week, you can filter by um, year, and then that allows you to see some of the work that, that we're renewing. Just let it go on a bit. Um, within there, what you can then do is, is you can um, focus on uh, the, the areas, so you'll see the possessions, you'll see the data that's within the possessions, and, and people can, can view that anytime they want, zoom in, zoom out of the tool. On the right hand side, you'll see a couple of panels. Um, bottom right will show you the, the depots that we've got um, and, and understand the number of possessions that we've got within, within, within the, the depots over that period of time. What we've also got there. Um, is you, you, you can start to have a look at where, where, the, where the issues and faults are on the network. So uh, some of the bubbles will represent uh, the defects that we've got on the network. And as you zoom into um, a location, you will be able to see where the faults and defects are. And, and therefore that allows us to really tackle the issues that we've got on the network. Um, at the moment, you know, that information is, is plugged into um, the ellipse system and people have to download it and it's quite difficult to, to visualize the, the actual where the area where the issues are on the on the network but what the tool allows you to do is is actually focus on um where the where the issues are on the network and, and then drill down and that, you can actually then um highlight the areas that you want to see and actually pull the data out so so you you are looking at the, the real life data that you've got and the key thing with this is is actually live um, so, so it's linked. So if, if there's a, uh, a an issue that's been closed out on the night, it will update in the system, and therefore it will it will be taken off the map. Some of the other benefits that that, that you can see, like on the left hand side, we can have a look at who who the suppliers are, who, which organisation is actually working on the network um, at any given point in time, and and some of the customer relations ship teams absolutely love it because when somebody rings up network rail to say we've got an issue on on our on our patch and, and somebody's making a noise on on the railways 
uh, the line side neighbours could complain. But what what we what we haven't got in place, but we have now, is the ability to really quickly look into the tool, see who's actually working in that possession, and have access to to get in touch with that the organize renewals organisation to, to to inform them and make that change. Cool, okay, I don't know if we can stop the video and I'll move on to the next slide. Great, thank you. Um, so, so what we then did in terms of tool that you saw, we, we actually um, pulled all that together and, and trialed it on one of our sites at North Wembley. Um, and, and this is where we worked really closely with the maintainer, identified the, the renewal that we were doing, the defects that were on that patch. Um, and then the, the key thing here was really to categorize the faults that we found. So we went through with the maintainer, the 127 de defects that were on that patch. And we were never going to solve absolutely everything. But what we could do is target the, the, the activities that we could do while we had staff on site. And on the right hand side, the colors really represent uh, what could be done by the, the current staff on site. The green green items where we actually need additional material um, or equipment that the maintenance teams could supply and then the orange was really actually do you know what we need we need additional material uh, equipment and labor for that activity and in there you can see we look we're looking to do a drainage um, update in terms of jetting so and then the final one that we had was um, if it was a maintenance activity, we didn't want to take that over. You know, you need special competencies and skills. So we left that to the maintenance team. But what that allowed us to do is actually focus on kind of the key areas. And at the end of the trial, we picked up or closed out 12 key activities for the route that they would not have normally uh, closed out. And that helped improve performance in that area. The bottom left shows you um, the, the asset handover process. Um, in terms of making sure that we've got absolutely clear accountability as to who, when the asset is being taken over and when the asset is, is being given back. And we actually had on our trial, we had the maintenance teams out there just double checking that they were happy with the work um, and that was signed off and then updated back into the, the system. And therefore, that was a really successful trial. And, and the next slide shows you some of the feedback that we actually got from, from a number of people around the business. And won't read through all of them, but some of the key ones I do really like. The first one was, you know, I'm in my twilight years of my career, but I can't wait to see this finally happen. And what they meant by that is actually um, IP or track renewals working alongside the maintainer. This new devolved state has allowed us to take advantage of that and, and actually work as a team on a route. The other one I like is really this, the, the one in the centre. You know, we think we can save cost and time within the DUs because they don't have to do any more planning um, and booking of possessions. That's all done by us and they can piggyback on and, and work within those possessions. The final one as well, you know, making sure that we're helping um, other parts of the business. The SEO um, resourcing team said, wow, the mapping tool will help me uh, better plan my tamper and haulage drivers more effectively across the network because I can actually see where we're doing renewals and that that will help me be a lot more efficient and, and so the challenges that we have on site about uh, drivers getting to getting to the locations that they need to do renewals well that's helping them um, overcome that issue and therefore the, the next steps for us really for, for the tool is to is to add the other possessions that we have in um, that we've talked about signaling civils and all, everything that we can pull out the PPS system and see if, see if we can map that uh, and that will again increase the, the opportunity that we, we have in terms of this new devolved world that we're working in. Thank you for listening and that's me. So I'm going to now hand over to James Murray who's going to talk to you about Kilsby Tunnel Blockade. Okay, morning all. I'm um, normally when I deliver uh, a presentation uh, about the blockade. Uh, I would normally focus on the engineering and delivery aspects of it uh, and probably drill into the detail of what we achieved in Killsby Tunnel. But today I want to sort of build on the philosophy of Project Heineken that Amit has outlined in his presentation. 
and like to expand on its principles and talk through how the northwest and central route through the the ops teams and the capital delivery teams manage the similar approach uh, whereby we manage to maximize the track access opportunity on the Kilsby tunnel blockade to great effect in track renewals blockades are, are nothing new and are often used to deliver critical and complex engineering works on the network uh, the Kilsby blockade in principle wasn't any different the route had a condition of track in the tunnel that was severely Im impacting performance and an opportunity was identified to improve the track and drainage in that location historically we would have planned the delivery blockade and been the primary goal and activity and remain the sole focus of that blockade third party access would have been requested but always brought risk and a nervousness to, to uh, to our challenge and probably historically wasn't always fully embraced under devolution uh, and the challenge uh, is uh, set down to us by northwest and central the issue where we have this longer possessions and disruptive access the challenge is to maximize its efficiency and use the first slide uh, talks it shows talks through the the job itself highlights the challenge that we were given the the origin and the concept was a challenge in itself uh, the blockade wasn't without its challenges it was delivered in the first two weeks of may in the midst of devolution ppf and covid 19 however three weeks earlier uh, the blockade wasn't on anyone's radar the idea and concept of the kilsby tunnel blockade started following a visit by the regional and route mds to the bletchley du where the issues being challenged uh, issues and challenges being faced by the maintenance teams and the ops teams were shared taking away the issues and recognizing the potential opportunity given the current state uh, of the industry at that time high level conversations commenced and an access opportunity was negotiated uh, and granted as a unique opportunity to go in and resolve the issues uh, within Kilsby Tunnel. The COVID pandemic had brought about a situation whereby the mainline traffic could be diverted without impacting performance and the train operating companies agreed to the blockade plan as it was evidence of the benefits it could potentially release further downstream. What wasn't clear when we were issued the initial challenge was that we only had two weeks to plan and put together uh, a production plan and program and design program that would deliver the work within Kilsby. Uh, challenging renewal plans at the changing renewals plans at the last moment uh, are never easy and are loaded with risk. However, going from a stand and start into a difficult environment was only adding to that challenge. However, from the initial challenge set to all the concept and the opportunity at the, the Kilsby blockade grew. Fortunately, from my perspective, the, the Aston team that delivered the work within Kilsby Tunnel had experience of the issues uh, and a fair idea of what to expect, which aided their development of the blockade plan. And from a standing start, the delivery plan, design and construction program pro, uh, programs were established. And with the help of the route planning and ops teams and SCO, a program was fleshed out. Over the two weeks, as you can see from the timeline, the plan was reviewed, challenged, went through a number of independent checks and peer reviews before it re received uh, a go position. As you can see from, from the next slide um, and the route itself, Kilsby Tunnel is only a small part of that blockade. And actually there was 35 miles of opportunity so whilst we de developed our plan to uh, renew the asset in the tunnel the ops team the program team and the delivery teams with the help of the uh, northwest planning and ops teams built a program and integrated works from the opex and capex programs drawing in bletchley du works delivery framework contractors along with CRSA to maximise the opportunity over that route over the 16 days of the blockade. The planning team 
split the uh, split the route into four sections to allow uh, the programs to be established and coordinated in a safe and thoughtful manner. And with the assistance of the engineering team and SEO, built the programs. Within two week timescale, the route team had a plan and a program that would deliver critical works day and night for 16 days around the clock, fully integrated, risk assessed, peer reviewed, and assured. In normal circumstances, the schedule forecast for the blockade would have been in the region of £25 million. The savings released from the renewal uh, and rectifying the condition of track probably released a benefit of £5 million to, £5 million to the route and notable perform performance improvements uh, to the train operating companies. Notwithstanding that, the savings that would have been uh, added in through the beneficial delivery of critical maintenance and heavy renewal items that are all also developed wouldn't be realised within them, them uh, numbers. The how it was delivered captures the control and command and how all parties within North Western Central came together and developed a control structure that was established and put in place to oversee the development and the delivery of the blockade plan. And this transitioned into a control hub that would oversee the safe delivery and compliant delivery of all work. And the structure brought a balance and rigour to the proceedings. It required all parties to be integrated into one team and broken into the bronze, silver and gold phases of the control that we are familiar with. And the structure was glued together and overseen by the Northwestern Central safety compliance and engineering teams. All work went through peer review and planning rigour to ensure a synchronised and safe plan was developed and retained. The Silver Command retained the hands-on control throughout the blockade and drew together on the support and leadership from all parties to make sure a fully aligned pro programme was put together. And the Northwestern Central Engineering Safety and Compliance Teams oversaw the compliance and safety delivery throughout. In terms of the, the delivery itself, uh, the challenge in steer from the south, from northwest and central leadership was clear and would only stand and succeed if an alliance approach was adopted. The plan was centred and controlled uh, and based around the same protocols in each area of the delivery. In, induction, pla induction packs developed, CDM processes established, peer reviews and safety task force reviews implemented throughout, clear SACs and reporting controls one standard COVID-19 safety operating procedure and a construction and insurance team overseeing the safe delivery of all work. I think the final slide just the, the, the final slide encapsulates why the delivery blockade worked and the, su the success and achievements were clear to all. Everybody had one set, one goal, one vision. There was clear leadership from the top. The programme worked as an alliance delivery. It brought together unity and effort from all. And under the banner of devolution, really brought on everybody's strengths to the party to make sure that the, the blockade was successful and delivered for all parties. The final slide just covers off some of the statistics that were achieved within it. But as you can see, there's a great diversity of delivery which, which goes through maintenance, works delivery activities, stakeholders, uh, and the renewal of the tunnel itself. Uh, the one stat that probably isn't captured, that should be the headline figure, is the blockade was delivered safely without accidents or incidents and achieved its objectives, which was removing the condition of track and improving that asset for the forthcoming year. <laughs> And that is the Kilsby blockade in a nutshell. Thank you, James, and thank you, Amit, for that fantastic presentation.
Um, so now we're going to go straight into uh, another project presentation. So uh, it's now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer McKinney and Nick Coles from Manchester Metro. So first, starting with, with Jennifer, uh, she joined the rail industry 15 years ago with Grant Rail, during which time she completed her civil engineering master's. She joined Amy in 2011 as a graduate, looking over a variety of roles, including civil de design, London Underground and Metrolink. In 2013, she joined Tube Lines, undertaking track maintenance and construction manager roles uh, for LU Track Delivery. And during this time, she managed and bought rail grinding uh, as into an in-house activity for LU. In July 2017, she joined Metrolink as head of infrastructure. Uh, and then also supporting Jennifer today's is Nick Coles Moore. Nick joined the railway industry nine years ago in Victoria, Australia. Uh, he's a civil engineer and has experience in light rail, freight, passenger and heavy haul rail infrastructure projects. In 2017, Nick started as the national manager of on-track machines for Downer, managing delivery of the flash butt welding and surface contracts across five states. And in 2020, he relocated uh, to the UK and joined Metrolink as Capital Works Project Manager on the Metrolink network. So Jennifer and Nick, over to you. Hi, thank you so much for uh, inviting us to join you today to be able to give a bit of a um, perspective um, from the light rail industry when it comes to track renewals. Uh, we've got some uh, quite specific challenges. Uh, not sure it's uh, working and letting me go to the next slide. Is it possible to get the next slide? Sorry. Um, we've uh, we've um, got uh, uh, we, we, we've got a renewal example uh, today that actually um, highlights some of the uh, specific um, embedded re-reigning and city centre renewals challenges, uh, which which were. Uh, made particularly challenging due to the uh, accelerated uh, timeline and uh, delivery time scales. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Uh, so I thought it would be a good idea uh, for those who, who don't know much about Metrolink to uh, give a bit of background uh, on us uh, and also let you know um, about some of the COVID-19 uh, measures that we've put in place and the additional challenges uh, that this has presented. Uh, we've got um, a section right in the city centre, uh, Market Street, where uh, the uh, rail condition uh, was a particular uh, particular concern um, with, uh, with a renewal project pending. Uh, and we had a real uh, challenge to, to renew it or to shut the uh, first city crossing in uh, quite a short time frame. So, uh, collectively with uh, collaboration with our client uh, had to quite quickly put together the uh, operational readiness and, and key customer comms with uh, managing a number of uh, key stakeholders to be able to deliver the works um, at what ended up um, having quite a number of challenges because we had extreme weather uh, throughout the uh, uh, closure period uh, which uh, which led to to a few delays um, and, uh, and and added to the uh, lessons learned for the uh, next renewals because this is the uh, first uh, in what will be um, renewals uh, throughout the city centre uh, in Manchester in the next uh, year or two, uh, notwithstanding the uh, challenges that, that COVID presents to renewals budgets and the like. Uh, could I get the next slide, please? Um, so Manchester Metrolink is now the largest uh, light rail network. We've got uh, we, we run at over 100 kilometres. We've got um, eight lines uh, with 99 stops, uh, and we run through seven of Greater Manchester's boroughs. So we, we you can see from the the, the map. I thought the uh, uh, geographical um, map actually it shows you just what an extensive area we cover and we've got quite a number of uh different track forms because we've um converted old uh, uh heavy rail lines from from Altrincham to bury uh, and through rochdale down to the airport and our uh services all run through if you just look to the center that critical corridor 
um, around Cornbrook and, and Deansgate Castlefield, um, where our uh, pre-COVID timetable had um, uh, 1,400 services per day. Um, uh, and whilst uh, there's not quite as many through the uh, uh, through the city centre section, which which we're talking about, re the the renewals works for. Um, there's a pretty significant uh, tram usage through uh, through the city centre sections. Um, so uh, we, we've got a couple of depots, one at Old Trafford and, and one at Queen's Road, and we've got a 120 trams uh, currently. Um, and we're expecting 27 more as part of our uh, um, capacity improvements uh, project. So there's a real focus on um, increasing uh, capacity that has been uh, uh, set in, in, in place in, in Greater Manchester. Uh, Keirless and Amy uh, took over the franchise in, in July 17, so we've had it just uh, for, for just over three years with the operator maintainer, uh, and we've got a seven plus three year contract. And Metrolink is owned by Transport for Greater Manchester, and they are the ones who are, are responsible for uh, renewals, enhancements, the extensions, and all of the upgrade works. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm sure um, with, a, with a network rail audience, um, most, of, most of the uh, uh, audience will know Amy. Um, I'm, I don't know if you'll be as aware of our uh, joint ventures with Keolis as an uh, international uh, transport operator, um, but we have three joint ventures with Keolis. So we've, we've, we've got uh, CAM, which is Keolis the Amy Metrolink, when you hear me refer to CAM a little later. Um, and the first of our joint ventures is actually Docklands Light Rail in London. And uh, more recently, we've got the uh, Wales and Borders uh, contract, which is quite a significant 15-year uh, contract uh, in, in Wales. Uh, could I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, just, to, just to start with, to give some kind of key context and, and background to the status of some of our uh, renewals projects, uh, a significant focus for, for, for TFGM for, for the last uh, decade has been expanding the network. So two thirds of the Metrolink network is, has been constructed in the last decade. Uh, and since the uh, start of the CAM franchise, the focus has really been on the Trafford Park extension. So a lot of our, uh, uh, our, our support from a capital works perspective has been focused in this direction in this direction and it's it's part of tfgm's uh, 2040 growth strategy uh, the 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 lines have been constructed by mpt so so langerock uh, volkers and talis uh, and this particular line um actually opened to the public on the 22nd of march this year so that was one day before uh, the uk was placed into lockdown uh, and and had um all of the uh, covid um measures come into place uh, and this project was actually seven months ahead of schedule so so um, T TFGM have uh, uh, d delivered a, a number of their um, extensions ahead of set schedule and, and, and this one was uh, similar um, and it uh, helped to actually uh, provide a, um, a vital transport service um, for, for key workers initially in the area. Um, for those who know Manchester well, uh, you'll you'll know this extension goes to the Trafford Centre, uh, which is one of the biggest shopping malls, and it adds another route to um, support um, Manchester United's football ground. So, some 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 key growth opportunities. But but the priority in the COVID context was was actually um, that uh, the line runs through um, Europe's largest industrial estate, uh, so it was uh, providing access. Uh, to the likes of uh, Kellogg's and, and, and Unilever's manufacturing facilities, uh, and, and this uh, particular um, particular line really really supported sort of trying to shift uh, Man Greater Manchester's transport uh, to more of a London-style transport and uh, creating um, the uh, the the capacity um, and, uh, and 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 growing the network has been one of the um, w one of the primary focuses. Can I get the next slide, please? Um, so we shifted quite quickly um, with the launch of, launch of a, a new line and all of the uh, um, efforts focused on making sure that that um, occurred successfully, but with a little less uh, fanfare than had been 
originally intended uh, to putting into place uh, measures um, uh, like the, the the rest of the industry um, to uh, enable us to focus on our essential maintenance as a priority with the additional COVID measures. Um, and as a result, many of the uh, capital projects were, were paused uh, and there was a criticality review on, on renewal projects, sort of risk assessing them uh, through the COVID lens um, to, uh, to determine which ones were the highest priorities. And I just wanted to highlight um, the uh, light rail specific uh, challenges in, in COVID um, down to having uh, an open network, but one that runs through the city centre as so we had Quite a quite a few challenges um, with uh, with easy access uh, to our staff um, working on the network. Um, so we all work pretty closely, um, and and this support was part of uh, the renewal work, renewals work as well uh, to um, get support from our securities uh, business partner and securities provider to help uh, protect our teams, uh, particularly with uh, the likes of uh, re-rails and any uh, major projects. We, we we don't want to be in the middle of works and uh, and not have the of the support on uh, on hand, um, but we did uh, do a lot of work to try and um, uh, pr promote um, uh, engagement with customers as well to make sure they uh, were uh, respectful of our, uh, our our clientele as well. It's just there's uh, some specific challenges in the uh, city centre. <laughs> um, can I get the next slide, please? Um, uh, which which brings me to Market Street, uh, which is the uh, um, location uh, of, of the renewal that um, we're, we're covering today. And the rail condition um, in this particular area was was one of the ones of key concern. So in reviewing uh, the projects that really needed to be prioritised um, from from a capital works um, perspective, uh, this was the key track renewal. Um, that was uh, that was concerning us uh, that we needed to ensure um, was uh, was delivered pre-COVID. Uh, TFGM had had uh, some some challenges engaging um, a an experienced uh, subcontractor to be able to undertake these works. It's, it's a high-profile location running right through the city centre, um, and this particular uh, particular site um, is ahead of of um, the, what, what will be the, the, the rest of the renewal of the city centre. Um, the previous uh, renewal scheme was undertaken in 2008. Um, so whilst it all sort of largely happened at the same time, because it's, it's quite a tight curve, this one's um, um, been um, ahead of the rest. Um, so we've closely been monitoring the, the condition um, uh, as, uh, as a network we'd recently brought in um uh, a formal temporary approved non-compliance process so the tank process which anyone familiar with uh, london underground or, or know it's it's modeled on that and it helps us to uh, meet the orr guidance around um risk assessing our, our key activities and our uh, track engineers we're, we're regularly reviewing the measures that we put in place um because of the concern that um, uh, a crack was uh, was uh, going to form in the keeper rail. Um, so to mitigate the risks, we put on a, a five mile an hour speed restrictions to reduce some of the uh, dy dy dynamic effects on the keep and to, to, to limit the um, effects if the keep was to, to fail um, with a wheel flange pass and, and could result in, in derailment. Um, we increased our, our dye pen testing to every two weeks uh, until the curve was, was going to be renewed so that we could monitor um, uh, assessing from the, the, the base of the groove to, to the top of the keep so that we could um, see if any uh, cracks, cracks were forming uh, and uh, we, we could um, implement uh, measures if necessary. So we'd um, agreed the, the go, no go when we need to take um, the line out of, of use. Um, we were monitoring the wear measurements. We increased this to a two weekly um, frequency. And then we got an enhanced daily visual inspection um, to see if there was um, uh, any, uh, any, any, growth, um, any, any growth developing. And we were tracking uh, the rate of the, the curve. So as, as the maintainer, um, we were uh, we were preparing for what we could do. Um, we um, and we were looking at what measures uh, we would be able to undertake. But our uh, 
intervention measures from a from a maintainer perspective were somewhat limited, uh, but based off of um, uh, previous experience um, with uh, gauge corner restoration welding process, we'd actually needed to suspend the activity um, because we'd found that there was quite a high failure rate in some of the locations within the city centre specifically. Uh, British Steel had been supporting us with our uh, rail break analysis and we'd actually identified that um, there was likely um, some installation issues uh, in the previous round of renewals, which were adding to the, some of the stresses if the, were, if the rail wasn't pre-curved um, or if it was like, like, slightly shoehorned into place. Um, and then Gage Corner um, restoration had, had been undertaken in this, uh, those same areas. We, we were finding it was too high a failure rate. So that really meant that, that, the, that the, the option was, was to renew or, uh, or to shut. Um, can I get the next slide, please? So that was really the uh, the challenge that we uh, that we faced um, finding a uh, renewal subcontractor from TFGM's framework had, had proved to be a bit of a challenge because there aren't too many with the uh, um, necessary experience uh, undertaking embedded re-railing. Um, there's quite a limited number of um, limited number of suppliers. Uh, and COVID-19 um, was adding uh, reportedly 20, sorry, 30% uh, to the timeframes of the um, upgrade programs that are going on in Sheffield and Nottingham trams. Um, so that was actually absorbing all the capacity for the for the uh, capable suppliers. So the challenge that was that was set for CAM um, was to support and collaborate with uh, TFGM um, and to, to look at what our best option would be. Uh, to take on delivering uh, the renewals ourselves, um, or actually look at needing to shut the first city crossing. Um, so for those who are not too familiar with Manchester, um, this was the original uh, crossing um, that connects uh, the old heavy rail sections from, from Altrincham to Bury uh, that uh, opened in um, 1992. Uh, and um, in 2017, uh, the construction on the second city crossing, uh, which goes via Exchange Square, was open. So this does actually give um, operational redundancy in the network, um, but it's it's typically there to um, support us for emergency responses when there are road traffic coll collisions or we've had public demonstrations cause us a number of number of chal challenges and trespassing and so on and so forth. Um, so whilst it does give us the redundancy to look at um, an extended closure, uh, which, is, which is what we ended up doing um, for the Market Street section um, with less disruption on the customer, uh, had um, 2CC not been in place. Um, and it was an option uh, with uh, having reduced uh, the uh, service pattern due to, due to COVID. Um, we were, we, we did have the option uh, and we did, we did consider whether we could um, uh, have an extended closure of 1cc, but th this was viewed as a pretty undesirable option. So the challenge for CAM um, was that we don't typically um, perform this type of work. Uh, as a maintenance activity, um, we uh, we deal with, um, our contract means we deal with rail breaks, um, but uh, that's typically the, the extent of our, uh, of our re-railing activities to date. So um, we um, engaged um, with uh, one of our uh, main um, contractors, PodTrack, uh, as one of our key partnership suppliers. So they, they do a lot of work for us, particularly on the overhead line uh, side of things. Um, and this allowed us to, to bring in, um, bring to collaboratively work on a, on a suitable plan to deliver the project. Uh, they, uh, um, they have a tier, they have an, a, an experienced track engineering team uh, who bring in experience um, from working on uh, the Birmingham um, uh, tram uh, re-railing works. So uh, once uh, um, uh, once once we started, the timescales were pretty challenging. Uh, the the discussions with the TFGM commenced in March. Um, uh, and we agreed that we'd uh, start the long lead items. So you need to uh, pre-curve the rail and the like in, in late April. Um, but actually the, the formal agreement um, to undertake the works wasn't in place until 
the 27th of July uh, and um, the uh, pre-build works commenced on the 29th of July with the possession starting on the 8th of August. So not, not, quite, as, not quite as tight as our previous presentation, uh, but some, some uh, tight timescales uh, nonetheless. Okay, get the next slide, please. Um, so we, uh, um, we 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 work closely as operator maintainers um, to um, uh, to put in place uh, an operational cleaners plan. Uh, to put put in place the operational readiness plan. Um, uh, working uh, on the driver rosters uh, and uh, bus replacement services and uh, customer um, service representative deployment plans uh, with some specialist needs around the um, COVID measures. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Um, and communicating the, uh, um, the walking routes to our customers was uh, uh, was was pretty key at short notice to make sure that they uh, knew the changes that we were uh, implementing um, as part of having uh, the the network shut. So there's really not very long uh, to walk between the lines. It was just making sure that um, they were clear, uh, particularly as we'd um, put in place a number of timetable changes, changing the routes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so communicating with our key stakeholders was really critical. Um, there was sort of constant prioritization um, because uh, we're in such close proximity with a number of the shops, particularly Debenhams, it's referred to as Debenhams Curves, um, and we needed to work closely with councillors and the um, uh, the uh, city, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and MPs, uh, keeping the mayor informed and we dropped a, a lot of letters uh, to let them know, uh, to let residents know uh, the works that were going to be undertaken. Uh, next slide, please. And hope, hopefully Nick's, uh, Nick's on, because I'll be uh, handing over to Nick. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'll take over from Jen here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we've got quite a few photos to come to uh, to just be able to power through to mainly save um, save people from having to try and understand an Australian accent as well. So hopefully that'll go all right. Um, <clears throat> this was actually an inverse from what I was quite used to in terms of normally keeping the railway or the tramway as the highest priority. In this instance, as Jen has already touched on, it was absolutely the inverse in terms of the council and the shopkeepers and the local residents were absolutely number one. And the tramway was, was almost probably third or fourth down the pecking order in terms of what we wanted was you know not that well considered. Um, as Jen said, a very challenging, very challenging project in terms of the timeline that we had to plan it and, and the working space that we had. So um, what Jen touched on there was this operational redundancy that we had there. So it was actually only about an 800 metre length of track that was shut um, for the nine days. You can see there that there was those other options for people to get between the two, um, the two parts of the network. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I'll just fire through these. Um, as you can see, right next to a road, right next to lots of buildings, very tight and constrained location, uh, lots of interaction with the public. Uh, it was just very challenging all round uh, in terms of how we how we managed that. We had security issues, so we had to have security presence to protect our people from the local um, residents and our you know, temporary residents, shall we say. Um, so that was, that was very challenging. Uh, next slide, oh, no, I think I can do it myself there. Um, so once we got the site set up, you can see just how constrained it was. <clears throat> and as we commenced removing everything, effectively what the biggest issue we had, as Jen touched on, there's a number of different track fixings that we have. In this location, we had to remove about 4,000 individual Yorkshire, stock, uh, Yorkshire stone block pavers. Unfortunately, each one of these was effectively unique and had to go in exactly where it came out. So it was like putting, trying to uh, put back together a 4,000 piece uh, puzzle set. And unfortunately, the puzzle pieces weighed about eight kilos each and had been left in the middle of a construction site for a week. So they tended to get a little bit jumbled up. Um, obviously, that's one of the significant lessons learned that we have um, from this activity on how we can do that better. Uh, so you could just see how, how time consuming and intricate that would have been to, to break all that out. And unfortunately, it was. Um, 
part of the issue that we had, unfortunately, halfway through, um, we had a meeting with TFGM, our client, and we, we actually decided to extend the possession for two days. Um, so we went, we went from nine days to 11 days due to a number of unknown conditions that we'd encountered, as well as uh, latent weather conditions that had hampered our progress and were also forecast to hamper our progress. Um, with 2CC being in place to be able to run trams throughout this throughout this period, we were still in a position to um, you know, minimise our impact to the public. So. Uh, as Jen touched on, had that not been an option, that would have been a very more, uh, very much a more difficult decision to make, if even one that was possible to make at all in terms of extending the possession. So again, being conscious of time, I'll just fire through some of these photos again. Um, I think this leads on to some of the things that other presenters have talked about today is that uh, aesthetically, this is a very, very nice product. It looks great in the city, but in terms of maintainability and um, you know, ability to renew and, and do improvement works on, it's incredibly challenging. So we have the good stuff that PWI, you know, works through and talks about, such as building in redundancy and stuff like that where we can, such as 2CC. And then we have the other end of it, which is um, this project, which is, as Jen has touched on, you know, the beginning of what's going to be a very challenging period of maintenance and renewals works for the Metrolink uh, in one of the most confined and restricted areas you can possibly get. Uh, this photo here on the right just shows you how close you are to some of these uh, department stores and other issues like that. Overheads above, um, on the right hand side, the outbound track uh, just beyond our worksite limit, the, the, the overheads were live, that's why it was constrained. Um, we had a road just to our right, we had pedestrians just to our left and that's why we couldn't send the fence out anymore uh, because we wanted to keep open um, that foot, footpath as much as possible to enable social distancing of the public. So just, just very challenging all around. Uh, in the end, we did get there. Um, we were able to operate trams, or we would have been able to operate trams um, within the nine-day period, but unfortunately, um, the pedestrianised surface was not reinstated in time, or was not reinstated adequately in time. Um, and of course, naturally, in the in the two days that we did extend the possession for, um, we got typical Manchester weather, uh, so it didn't really help us that much in the end. Um, I'll just keep going through all these. Eventually, we did get out of there. Um, as I said, it was, it was incredibly challenging. You know, we did have a number of things that we've learned from it. Um, and as Jen might touch on a bit later, as, a bit later on, and as Project Heineken talked about, um, this did enable us to um, incorporate other key activity, even over this very short section of track, the 800 metres that was shut, to enable us to do other critical work that um, you know, we may not have otherwise reasonably thought about or reasonably looked to have undertaken. So um, I think that takes us onto the lessons learnt page. I'll, I'll probably skip over that and just leave um, leave the next one for Jen to discuss, which is just the final bit of uh, our remote condition monitoring progress. Thank you. Um, yes, n number of uh, lessons learned and one of the key takeaways uh, for us is just highly highlighting how important um, our remote condition monitoring project is. So automating uh, the rail measurements so that we can be predicting the life of our assets is, is, is really critical. There are a number of um, lessons that we can take away about improving the um, uh, renewals uh, uh, works that we undertake, but I think being able to actually predict and, and, and plan for the works is just um, one of the really critical activities. So we are looking to uh, implement um, uh, tram tram mounted uh, equ equipment um, uh, as, as as soon as we can, uh, and I think that will be one of the key um, step changes that we take uh, as we uh, move on to what will be renewing the uh, city centre in the coming years and getting the accurate um, time frames uh, to to avoid some of the additional challenges. Um, that this uh, accelerated work uh, work program has uh, has presented. Um, so uh, thank you very much for ha for having us today. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jen and Nick. Um, so I'd now like to take this opportunity to uh, invite. Uh, Amit and James back to join Jennifer and Nick for the third Q&A session. Uh, so again, just a reminder, question, question functionality, please use that on the right hand side of your screens. And like I said, it would help uh, if you direct the question to, to the name of the person that you wish to ask. And so uh, uh, to kick us off, 
Uh, this is for Amit. There's a few people have just raised the question. Um, uh, so from Pete Halliwell and Philip Hall, I'm, I'm, I'm amalgamating a few questions together here, but just in terms of the, the Project Heinegan tool, obviously you talked about it capturing uh, maintenance backlog, uh, you know, work overdue. Uh, will the tool look at, um, uh, look forward and look at planned, planned ellipse uh, maintenance tasks? No, thanks for the question, Liam um, and team. Um, at the moment, like as we say, we're, we're tackling the backlog to, to, to bring us back up to speed. Um, but, but there are plans going forward to, to incorporate new, new uh, items that come into the system. Um, th the issue that we've got at this very stage is, is the amount of data that we're capturing and, and representing on a map. Um, what we're looking to do on the current network rail infrastructure that it's on, it's not capable to, to kind of capture tons and tons of data that we're putting on and, and the plan is to move it onto the network rail cloud that we have access to now and therefore we'll be able to map not just the future works but all, also all the cyclic maintenance that we do. So, you know, every three months if we go out to a certain location, we'll be able to capture that uh, and, and, and demonstrate and show that on the map as well, which again will help a number of people in the business um, when they're planning to do works in that area. Okay, thank you, Amit. Um, so next question, a uh, question for, for Jen and, and Nick. It's uh, uh, you, the, the newly installed rail. What is the life expectancy of the newly installed rail? Uh, and and yeah, how, how long until you foresee the next Renault's intervention at that site? That, that, that's a good question. That was partly why I wanted to highlight the uh, remote condition monitoring project. I think one of the reasons for the timescales of, of this renewal being so short is um, that the previous batch of renewals were in 2008, um, having having been in situ for 15 years. So I, th I think there was a, a, a bit of a view um, or a bit of an education piece that we had with our with, with our client on um, how uh, much the tram service has increased over um, the uh, the last decade, which has expedited in some of the critical locations. So um, I think a lot of it is going to come down to what service pattern is. We've got 27 additional new trams. Uh, the COVID timetable may have reduced in some sections, but because we've doubled up for social distancing, it actually increases some of the traffic over the area. So it, it's really gonna be a function um of um the services that we have um over the sections but uh based off of um uh what we know at the moment i, th I think that we're looking at 10 or 12 years um so it really does highlight i think some of the lessons and the intricacies in the in the block work and looking at are there other track forms which will allow us to make it easier to renew but also to maintain and then to replace um for, for the longer haul so there's some whole life decisions uh notwithstanding the the COVID budgetary challenges. Thank you, Jen. Um, okay, so moving on to a question. Um, so this is it's again from Andy Franklin. This is for this is for James. So it's good to see strong joined up thinking for a blockade. How do we roll out these tools, methodologies, uh, behaviours to the wider network? Sorry, Liam. Could you just repeat the back end of that? Just broke up slightly. Yeah, okay, so uh, a question was, um, it's good to see joined up blockade thinking, it's essentially how can we roll this out uh, to, to the wider network? I, I think it was, I think it, co it comes from the top uh, in terms of the aspirations and expectations um, and the collective thinking of bringing all parties together to, to, to harmonize that approach. Um, the tools are different. I think it's it's more it's more the, the the behaviors and setting the expectations, and that was clear from the start from from both Tim and James, uh, and and seeing the route as one. We we all had the same goal. We all strive for the same objectives under putting the passenger first, um, uh, and then in terms of working through and differentiating what tasks could be done and where and giving everybody sort of equal space to achieve what they needed to achieve so there is a balance not everything can be done uh, there will be limitations within certain areas uh, we're probably quite fortunate in terms of how this structure applied but it can be seen from the output in terms of what was achieved by balancing, balancing off risk with activities and trying breaking down possessions into into chunks 
um, to, to manage and coordinate the logistics. I think we achieved um, uh, the goals that were set at the beginning, certainly within the shortened timescales, and I think probably the shortened timescales helped everybody to bring, bring that plan together more efficiently and effectively. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, I just want one quick one, if I can, just for Amy, um, just uh, very quickly. Um, how soon can can this tool, the, the Project Heineken tool, be, be rolled out to, to the rest of the country? So I think um, just to, to to answer that, Liam, I think we're in the process of trialling it with, with Northwest and Central on some of the other patches that we've got, uh, and then the plan is because we're, we're trying to incorporate. A, number of data sets across the business the minute we get it onto the the, the network rail cloud i think that will allow us to, to to kind of share it far and wide we are also looking at potentially um, making the tool um, external facing as well uh, potentially there's an opportunity to, to, to let the public see some of the renewals that we're doing um in terms of data sets where if people are making complaints on site so so there are absolute plans to expand it um in terms of time frames if i'm being honest i couldn't really tell you how long this will take i think it's as quickly as we can get the, the data into the cloud and then have a, a control mechanism in place to, to to give people views so brilliant okay thank you very much uh amit uh uh James, Jennifer and Nick um, for that and we're, we're now going to move on to, to the next round of presentations. So um, as part of this next slot it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brian Whitney, he's the engineering expert in Network Rail. Uh, so Brian joined RailTrack in August 2000, two months before the Hatfield derailments. Uh, he joined as a metallurgist and materials engineer uh, covering all aspects of rail management with an initial focus on broken and defective rails. However, little did he know how much a focus on broken rails and RCF uh, this would become when Hatfield occurred two months into the role. So Brian has had various titles and positions over the last 20 years, uh, mostly part of the central function. Um, he is currently an engineering expert in the track and SNC team in the wider technical authority under the chief engineer. So Brian, over to you. Well, thank you, Liam. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've got a task, think back 20 years. It's nearly 20 years in three weeks, two weeks, three weeks time. We will be uh, 20 years after the Hatfield accident. <clears throat> um, just going through this and a few things that I thought I'd cover, really around lessons we've learned, some of the things that we've perhaps introduced, we've done well, we've made effective, perhaps some things that we haven't done so well and made effective. So. A bit of a whistle stop tour, uh, 15 minutes hopefully, and uh, I'll start hopefully if I can move on the slide. I'm not sure. Thank you, Kate. Um, really, as a bit of background, a uh, pretty normal day it was. I was at Houston sitting in the office on the ninth floor of Rail Track House, and ironically, I can remember it well looking at ultrasonic procedures for the inspection of rail. But yes, train left King's Cross at 12:10. Uh, and about uh, 15, 13 minutes later, it was around uh, Wellham Curve, just approaching Hatfield. And those are familiar, there's a long right hand curve into a left hand curve before the station. The train was travelling at 115 miles an hour. And after passing underneath Oxley's Avenue Overbridge, uh, the crew observed the sudden brake application uh, and realised then there had been a significant incident as the train was buffeted and shaken around. Um, the train broke up in effectively into three pieces after derailing on a, a broken rail on the high rail of the curb. The first two coaches and the loco remained on the track, but the remaining eight vehicles derailed to the left, travelling from the down fast across the down slow, a number of them turned over on, on their sides. Uh, the middle of the train, uh, the buffet car, probably because it was somewhat heavier, a higher centre of gravity, turned over, that collided with two OLE stanchions, uh, did a huge amount of damage, and I'll show some pictures there. And the four fatalities were all located within the service coach. Um, this had impacted two stanchions uh, and torn a large some chunk of the body side and the structure of the, the roof out. Uh, about 30 other people required hospital treatment. And the rail broke up a high rail on the curve 
Uh, it was an MH2 premium rail steel, less than five years old, uh, that broke up over about 35 metres from a, an initial large defect from rolling contact fatigue. And next slide, please. Uh, a stark picture here, this is the south end of the site, looking north on the down fast in the forefoot. Uh, the left hand rail, the high rail of the curve, a right hand curve. Uh, that is where the rail is believed to have broken first. Uh, a large transverse defect from the rolling in contact fatigue. As the train then derailed past the cross and, and drifted out onto the curve, that broke the rail up. You can see the, the carnage, the shattered pieces of rail there, uh, and the back end of the train just there, about 150 yards from the point of the derailment. The rest of the train is further north around the curve. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this is a series of pictures. The first one on the left hand side I've indicated the point of the derailment. Uh, you can see there where the ballast is disturbed, that's where the rail broke up and the train then passed out towards the down slow, across the down slow, heading straight on rather than negotiating the curve. The front of the train, you can get the picture. Uh, the front uh, locomotive and two carriages remained on the track, but the rest of the train broke up in the middle section. Uh, then compacted or impacted with the OLE stanchion, you can see the damage that that then caused to the uh, the service vehicle, the buffer car on that particular train set. Um, yeah, a large amount of damage just ripped the, the, the complete body shell apart in that situation. And next slide, please. A few things I've picked out, and these are some. Uh, underlying causes identified by the formal inquiry after the accident and some of those it's a, a, a sort of thought and things and things we've learned and what I wanted to base some of the discussion today on so certainly there was a, a heavy criticism and a lack of appreciation of the risk presented by gauge horn and cracking or rolling contact fatigue as we tend to call it now uh, and failure to develop and disseminate comprehensive instructions on its identification and control measures, uh, subject to significant time in court. Uh, there was a failure to manage a competent visual inspection regime and to manage ultrasonic inspections uh, and to take appropriate action to maintain the line. I think that's quite an important point. There was a lot of information known at the time, but perhaps actions were not taken appropriately to ensure it remained safe. So whilst inspections themselves can be effective, Applying the right actions afterwards is what's important then in uh, controlling the risk. Uh, a general comment about management of contracts relating to the maintenance and renewal of the track. There was heavy criticism over the delayed railing of that particular curve and how that's managed. And a lesson I think rail track at the time learned in court afterwards that although we contracted our maintenance and renewals, we were still responsible for the risk and the competence those contractors who were working on infrastructure on our bar. Uh, also the failure of the competing railing at the curve, and that largely left the rail in a, a serious condition that subsequently resulted in its failure. And the failure to find on acting actions of audit reports relating to adequate knowledge of the track asset. So a number of sort of key things that were uh, combined together that came out of the inquiry. I've just tried to summarise a few of the key ones. Next slide, please. Uh, a broken rail graph, my usual stock set of slides. Uh, some big changes. This shows typically we ran about 750, 800 broken rails a year. This is a graph from 1962 up to, to this year. Uh, you can see at Hatfield around 2000, we had 952 broken rails that year. That's now greatly reduced. That's now down to around 100 a year, you can see. But some of the challenges there, the big drops there where there's some easy benefits to gain, but perhaps more difficult to drive numbers down further. So some big successes there, but uh, I'll show some of the risks that still exist. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, just a summary of the last 10 years. These are broken rails from surface damage, for instance, RCF and squats. And although the numbers are very small, you can see we're typically around two, three, four a year. Uh, we still have a number of these breaks, which in, in the best case, well, or best well, should be preventable by thorough inspection. 
and appropriate actions taken on those inspections. Next slide, please. A couple of examples really to try and sort of bring home. This was a break from January 2019 uh, around South Harrow. You can see the, the left hand picture, a large transverse defect in the head of the rail. Uh, that broke initially, uh, then a secondary break occurred from a much smaller defect. You can see that in the other pictures there. So although uh, that small defect wouldn't be expected to break the rail under normal conditions because the cantilever was there, that resulted in a secondary break and about 350 millimetres of the rail head or rail section being lost. Fortunately, in this situation, uh, trains passed over that uh, and no derailment occurred. Next slide, please. Next one, similar picture, a uh, similar set of pictures, this time December 19, um, uh, up further north, this is north of Newcastle, Portland, near uh, Morpeth. But a broken rail this time, not from rolling contact to see, but from a, a tash of rail defect and inclusion in older rail steels. But again, a large defect that broke initially, a much smaller defect that then broke as a result of the increased dynamic force on the track. So again, a risk of uh, significant risk of derailment with that section of rail coming out, but fortunately again, no derailment at this situation. Next slide. There's a common theme to these pictures you'll see. Again, transverse defect from RCF, fortunately this time only a single break. This was earlier this year uh, on the up quarry line uh, down towards the, the Gatwick Express route uh, on Sussex. And again, broken rail this time, a premium rail steel, an HP335 grade steel, uh, less than five years old, but a large transverse defect is propagated from the rolling contact fatigue. That resulted in an initial break. Fortunately, no secondary break in this instance, no derailment. But again, another example that the risks still are, are present, even though numbers are small. Next slide, please. Now, this is an example, perhaps some of the things, it wasn't perhaps a complete surprise, uh, the broken rail occurred. This is an example of any current data taken for a year before the broken rail. You can see from the, the top line, there's a series of plots. There are uh, seven plots there over the year from each time the UTU ran. And you can see a small amount of patchy RCF on the first plot at the top, uh, increasing severity as you go down the page with more severe RCF and extensive RCF occurring. So we were, we were seeing some of this data and it's uh, useful information, but making use of that, getting that embedded in the organization, making that data available, is one of the big challenges. So significant worsening conditions here, but uh, again, even with suspects identified by the train, uh, ultrasonic uh, indications, we failed to act appropriately there to prevent the rail breaking. So uh, a stark reminder there that just having data isn't necessarily uh, controlling the risk, applying the appropriate actions is important. Next slide, please. A couple of examples, and I'll go through them very quickly. These are broken rails in the last 10 years. This one was a small defect in the foot of a bullhead rail in S and C, but caused a freight derailment. And you can see the train there foul of the adjacent line. Fortunately, no subsequent collisions and no injuries in this instance, but uh, a, a reminder, broken rails do not fail safe. And uh, a small number result in significant derailments. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Another example this time from October 2014, uh, the Vale of Glamorgan in Wales. Uh, again, another rail defect. It's a longitudinal split in the rail head, allowed the rail to break up below rail of a curve and derail the freight train. You can just see the back of that, the aftermath, and the shaft rail end in those pictures. The right hand picture shows the defect within the rail, which caused the rail head to separate and fail. Uh, that led again to the derailment. Unfortunately, there no no subsequent collisions, uh, no injuries. Next slide, please. A, a couple of things that came out the formal inquiry, and uh, it was something I went through and reread again with interest. Uh, some of them we did do perhaps quite well. Some of them less effectively. Uh, I'll go through a couple of them. Uh, making sure we've got 
adequate control mitigation measures for gold gauge corner cracking, improving ultrasonic and visual track inspection methods, looking at rail grinding to optimise the benefits, looking at deferred renewal process is something important there where we're not doing work at the right times or planned times, making sure we are we controlling risk there, making sure we've got an, an important one that comes up in many incidents, movement of staff together with recruitment and training programmes to ensure staff are competent. I think a big challenge and something that John mentioned earlier is one of his big things there about ensuring competence of people working on the railway. Things like a, a national database to record the state of all rail track, including any flaws. We put RDMS, our rail defect management system, but that didn't come in until 2008, eight years after the incident. I think it's fair to say that Tiger more recently, which looks a similar system, but using track geometry faults to record and, and to control those. That's only been currently being rolled out now some 20 years later. Some of the others, uh, making electrification stanchions less aggressive to reduce the effect of collisions. You can see the damage in the earlier pictures that it did to the train and the train collided with it. Uh, something there, certainly having looked at some of the structures from the Great Western Electrification Programme, uh, I don't think less aggressive would be the way I'd describe some of those. So, so lessons there which perhaps don't directly uh, impact, but lessons often learned in that situation. Uh, some of the others there, making sure we've got secure cab to signalling communication, success is there, and an audit system to be re-evaluated. That comes up quite often after incidents. Are we checking? Do we know what's being done? Are we making changes? Are we picking up precursor incidents? Next slide, please. Uh, last couple of bits I wanted to talk about and some questions or some challenges to pose just generally. Are lessons learned from these incidents? Some of them I think, yes, they are, but are the risk adequately addressed and controlled? And are controls still effective? We often bring in immediate things post an incident, but do they actually get embedded long term? Do things then change and new changes introduced? This allows sort of new risks or allow the existing controls to become ineffective. So some challenges there where We've seen stuff, we've done stuff, but do they really get embedded? Are they then permanent or are they uh, a sort of knee-jerk reaction? So some challenges there. I looked in the history books a little bit and believe it or not, 22 rail accidents at Hatfield since 19, or 1850 in the last 170 years. So typically just one location on the network, we have an incident every seven and three quarter years. And of this particular note, Three examples, all on the down fast, all accidents involving passenger vehicles, all resulting in derailments from broken rails. So although widely spaced, these incidents, and I think lightning may not strike once, it might strike many times, but uh, certainly something there, lessons to be learned from the past where similar accidents have occurred, uh, resulting in the most recent one at Hatfield. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just looking at some of the controls and the familiar graph there, what I've tried to do is show here, and uh, there's a large number of things to add to this. I was hoping they might all appear together, so if you could click on, thank you. It wasn't an easy task. There wasn't one magic solution. It's a combination of a large number of initiatives, improvements, changes that have all brought about these reductions. So it's it's not a quick win. It's not an easy task. And it's not necessarily one thing you can affect. It's many things that all need change and making sure those changes remain. So certainly some challenges going forward to ensure we keep those controls. And I won't go through those in detail. Next slide, please. Uh, really, uh, what's John to mention, it's a long continuous improvement. And certainly a lot of it has come through better monitoring, better data analysis making decisions based on the data and the analysis, understanding the root cause of things. So often we, we're very good at, at correcting symptoms, perhaps less effective at controlling the root cause and managing the risk. And certainly a challenge now, the professional head of track coined the phase 50 by 30, with the challenge of how do we get to 50 broken rails a year by 2030. And so much more to do there. So Few things to think about, but really the message, make sure we learn from incidents, 
make sure we apply the necessary controls and make sure those are embedded in the organisation and those changes are effective and permanent. Uh, other than that, many thank you, many thanks for listening. Uh, I'll hand you back to Liam, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Brian, and look forward to you joining us in the Q&A session shortly. So uh, now I'd like to move on to the, the final presentation for today. So I'd like to introduce, uh, first of all, David Woods. So David is a track engineer with over 20 years experience in the rail industry. Uh, he's a fellow of the PWI and chair of the PWI Manchester and Liverpool section. We've got Andy Jarman. Andy has over 20 years sorry, 27 years experience in design, construction and management of railway and highway civil engineering uh, for network rail and for major, major design consultancy houses. Uh, he has a wide range of civil projects acting as a designer, project engineer and an asset manager. Uh, and also Tom Kemp. So Tom is a chartered engineer with the IET and has worked in rail projects for over 18 years within electrification, design and construction. So, uh, gents, over to you. Thank you, Liam. See if I can click over. Boop, boop, boop. Right. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm David Woods. I'm the track representative today. I'm joined by. Tom and Andy, uh, electrification and uh, civils respectively. So I'm going to talk through a system approach to electrical clearances, overline structures, and this is a route to acceptance that we've been working on uh, on Northern programs. Uh, and, the, and the main programs we've been working within Northern programs have been Transpennine route upgrade, which is uh, Manchester to York, and also um, uh, Bolton to Wigan electrification, which is in the early grip stages. I think a key thing I'm, I'm trying to promote here is we're at a track renewal conference, but ideally what we're trying to promote here is to avoid all track renewals as possible. Uh, we're sharing where we are at the moment, it's kind of work in progress. Uh, so I'll probably put that caveat out there. And uh, ultimately what we're trying to drive at is a cost effective electrification. So earlier this year, um, January, there was a there was a review with the directors of engineering and asset management from both sides of the Pennines, uh, along with the root asset managers. And uh, the process was to the meeting premise was to get buy-in or gain buy-in to making Transpennine route upgrade uh, a more viable option. Uh, so today's presentation will go through the background to system approach to electrical clearances, as we coined it. Uh, introduce a multidisciplinary one pager and then just work through a couple of the uh, schemes we've been working on show how we've done the early application of this approach over to you tom i'll just click over can't see you tom Thanks. I think I've just been unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, first slide um, piece from the Rail Media recently quoting our CEO Andrew Haynes on the need for electrification to meet our decarbonisation commitments. Um, at the bottom there, important point highlighted in yellow uh, that we must find cost-efficient ways of electrifying. And clearly the work that's been done on bridge clearances at Cardiff has, has grabbed the headlines as he, as he mentions it there. Uh, it's important to recognise that it's not a silver bullet for every scheme, but it's certainly significant on, on TRU and we'll, we'll show that later on. Okay, uh, another piece of recent relevant news, um, Network Rail System Operator recently published their traction decarbonisation network strategy, uh, interim programme business case, and this was a major milestone in decarbonisation of rail. Uh, the map on the right here shows all the routes that are recommended for uh, electrification. It's too small to see in this slide, but the conclusion is that out of 15 
15,400 remaining STK, which is unelectrified. We've got to electrify 11,700 of it by the year 2040. Uh, so, and that's approximately 84%. For context in CP4 and 5, and that means uh, Great Western, Northwest, EGIP, et cetera, we electrified around 2,000 STK. So clearly we've got a massive challenge on our hands. So quick recap on voltage control clearances, and I'm aware that uh, Richard Stainton's already given a, a detailed presentation on this subject before to uh, the PWI, so I don't want to go over old ground. But in terms of a, a quick recap, um, the concept was developed and introduced at Cardiff Intersection Bridge uh, with you know, huge success because it saved a, a £40 million intervention. Uh, that's not the bridge there, incidentally. Um, they provide us a, a way to satisfy uh, electrical performance requirements without the need for expensive interventions that we would traditionally have, such as bridge recons or, or track lowers. And, and we think it's going to be a key tool in making electrification affordable um, and meeting that decarbonisation legislation. So a little bit more uh, detail on, on what voltage control clearances actually are. Um, the table on the right there, um, the middle column shows that traditionally, uh, well, in in recent um, introduction of uh, group standard GLRT1210, we're required to give 370 millimetres of air clearance to achieve basic insulation for 200 kV peak voltage. And the right hand column shows that by applying voltage control clearances, we can reduce this to as low as 20 millimetres and still achieve the same electrical performance. People might wonder why 200 kV and not 25 kV. Um, 200 kV is the peak voltage we've got to design for, for transient voltages such as lightning strikes. So under normal conditions, the voltage seen by the OLE equipment is actually far less. So if we introduce surge arresters, as we can see at the top here, um, either side of a bridge in line, um, we can safely discharge those peak lightning voltages and therefore safely reduce the air clearances required anywhere between those surge arresters. Um, further mitigations are contact wire insulated covering, uh, stress graded bridge arms, which we use to support the contact wire beneath bridges, and GLS coating, which we apply on metallic bridges. And all these combine to allow us to significantly reduce those air clearances to the, the numbers that you can see on the right and avoid those costly interventions. Um, we quickly identified that to make this work, we would need to adopt a real systems approach um, between track structures and OLE, perhaps something we've not been great at in the past, even though we, we have IDCs, etc. A lot of the time, designs under, under structures in particular are developed independently. So we, we set about thinking on how we could overcome that. And also one of the main hurdles would be to get the buy-in from the um, respective root asset management teams who, you know, between the disciplines actually have competing requirements. Um, so to overcome that, we, we um, with the help of our head of engineering and the director of asset management on uh, both Eastern region and Northwestern Central, we organized a workshop uh, that got all the RAMs in the room, uh, the project, uh, project engineering managers, uh, lead discipline engineers, and we talked through these principles and to effectively gain high level support for this because it's a real if we can if we can make it work it's a real game changer for TRU. Um, the following principles were agreed um, to make this work so just working from the top if a clash is identified um, managed trap position or voltage control clearances can can help solve the clash then that's to be assumed to be an acceptable baseline position and that allows us to then move forward with the following points and, and the, these are Two, three, and four are taken from from standards, really, from GLRT twelve ten. That we will always strive to to provide the maximum reasonably practicable value of clearance. Um, demonstrating that is 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 sometimes tricky, but that but that's that's the part of the process. Um, we'll show that alternative solutions to achieve compliance aren't reasonably practicable. Um, we'll undertake a CSM RA at each structure where required uh, by the standards. And then this is the key one. The, the Rams expressed a strong preference if we could try and pull all, all this 
process and thinking together into some sort of uh, one pager as it's become known uh, which is a, a document a little bit like a WAF that, that brings together all the information and forms the basis for the RAM review workshops and that was agreed in principle and that's what we've been working on ever since. Just to talk about what goes into that one page it's just to to you know get us thinking at an early stage about um you know what the impact is on each of the of the disciplines so you see on the left from a civils perspective you know we're forced to look at the level of intervention that would be required to achieve um normal clearances what the ownership of the bridge is any utility diversions that are required and is it a reasonable opportunity to replace the structure? It might be in the root business plan to replace that structure anyway. So it's trying to tease out all that information before we start designing. Similarly for track, um, you know, what, what type of intervention would be required for full clearance? Is it a full dig or can we get away with something less? Um, you know, is managed track position uh, proposed through there? You know, what would the impact on drainage be? And then from an OLE perspective, a voltage control clearance perspective it's just to note down what the clearances uh, would be um, what mitigations would be proposed and then generally um, from a whole life cost and carbon impact perspective um, if we can get voltage control clearances to work that's that's generally um, the, the most favorable solution from a from a whole life cost and, and carbon perspective I'll hand back to Dave now to take you through some examples of, of, of maybe where we could have um, done with this approach on previous projects. Thank you, Tom. So the images you've seen in front of you there, uh, uh, Charlie, which is on phase four of Northwest Electrification. Um, obviously, the uh, oh, it's nice working, uh, uh, obviously the, the image here is 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 before uh, the the wires uh, go up, but in essence, what we had to do at this location to provide full clearance was to uh, lower the track by 300 mil. Uh, the existing track configuration was steel sleepers, so we we we, we had a lower that uh, went into very some very soft subgrade. We needed uh, formation treatment, and we tried to mitigate the depth of that by putting gear cells in. The adjacent, if you can call it, a retaining wall wasn't in the best of condition for the cutting. Um, the solution to the retaining wall to accommodate the lowers was the king uh, post wall and then eventually became a sheet pile solution. Uh, this also had interfaces with buried services. There was a, a water main sewer that came across here. We had to install new drainage and we had key line side uh, neighbour issues whilst the piling was going on uh, and that was a key challenge. So we could have utilised Voltage control clearances at this location, there's two bridges that had this work. Uh, it might not have fully removed the, the scope of work, but it would definitely have dramatically have, have utilised it. And, and when when voltage control clearances were presented at the PWI, I think it was Derby 2019, I, I just thought we've gone through a lot of pain for, for no good reason, to be honest. Uh, so that's just a reason why I'm keen to kind of avoid renewals for, for electrification where we can, if possible. So from a track perspective, what we're trying to do to accommodate voltage control clearances, uh, we're implementing managed track position uh, that's been alluded to early in the conference. Uh, where we are going for voltage control clearances, we're going for managed track position level two. So that it means that the track always goes back to its design position. Uh, initially in the requirements for transparent route upgrade, there was a request to accommodate or a uh, 100 mil track maintenance uplift allowance. Uh, in the standards at the moment, uh, vertically, the full tolerance is, is plus 25 and close tolerance is plus 15. Uh, so I, I guess we're going to go into a poll query in a minute, but uh, I think, yeah, so, so uh, we've got what is the, the track maintenance lift allowance? Do you believe would be acceptable on ballasted trap with managed trap position in place? Ultimately, this is for where there's uh, uh, where you're at a bridge or a tunnel. Uh, so, if you could, if you could select what you believe is the most appropriate, I had cut out at no expense a piece of paper to show 15 mil 
25, 50 and 100 mil, but uh, I don't think you can see them at the moment. So, uh, yeah, if you can select away, just bear in mind that you could construct the track and the construction tolerances at the moment are minus 20 plus 10. So you could be very close to 15 mil before you know it. Um, if we can close the, okay, yeah, that was my no expense word. Kind of little sketch there. Dean Mill. From the middle of the top, there we go. Okay. And then another one from a kind of a track or multidisciplinary perspective is we have got some tight clearances on transparent reasonable upgrade. Um, and sometimes with electrification, or you know, the premise was when you did follow electrification, you'd probably get a W12 freight gauge from that area. That's not the case in these scenarios using voltage control clearances. And what we do need to do if we are requiring a freight intervention is, is kind of at least be transparent about what the costs and what the driving, uh, what the costs uh, interventions are for. Okay, and then I'll pass over to Andy, I believe. Thank Thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to touch upon some of the structures, maintenance issues that we faced as we've been working with some of our structures rams uh, using voltage control clearances. Uh, these have uh, broadly fallen into the categories that you can see on the screen. So where we have masonry over bridges or tunnels, uh, the effects of electrification on the ram's ability to carry out repairs to address lining condition. Uh, where we have wet tunnels and there's the risk of flashovers or icicle formation. And then there's the question of responsibility for the inspection and maintenance of the insulated paint that's part of the VCC system. Being fair, uh, with the first two points, the repairs and the, uh, the water management, these aren't new issues brought about by the, uh, the use of VCCs. You can have the same issues with uh, conventional electrification clearances and, and even with, uh, with vehicle gauge. So moving on to the next slide, this slide illustrates the, the issue regarding clearances to undertake masonry repairs and the use of uh, sweeps and lags or, or sweeps and tees as, as temporary works. Uh, typically, the, the sweeps and lags extend 250 millimetres from the, the face of the lining and, and obviously could foul the electrical clearances, um, meaning you couldn't leave the temporary works in place outside of a, an isolation. Uh, so this slide shows what was agreed with, uh, oh, going back. Uh, this slide um, shows what was agreed with one of our tunnels rams uh, where we're looking to introduce uh, OLE through through a tunnel. So for that part of the, uh, the tunnel lining where it's not possible to install sweeps and lags and maintain electrical clearances, uh, the project has agreed to carry out masonry repairs in advance of the electrification works. And you can see um, the zone of those works highlighted by the kind of gray shading on the on the sketch. Uh, so moving on to uh, water management. So the photo on the left um, shows drip sheeting installed in a tunnel uh, to prevent water dripping onto either the rail or the OLE or both. Uh, and then you've got the photo on the right, which shows uh, an extreme case of icicle formation, uh, both at the tunnel portal and, and within the, the bore itself. So drip sheeting as a form of tunnel water management is, is not preferred at all by the, the structures RAM community. Um, it prevents examination of the tunnel lining and can become detached under aerodynamic loading from, from passing trains. So this is the, uh, the solution that was agreed again in, in one of our tunnels where we're looking to introduce uh, OLE and where we have uh, uh, water ingress. So what you can see by the sort of blue shaded area is that for the width of the lining profile uh, where the water ingress was uh, what's known as W3 or worse, so that, that terminology comes from the, uh, the tunnel detailed examination, uh, we're planning to uh, carry out injection waterproofing of the lining uh, with collection pans and downpipes uh, to mitigate the risk of, uh, of water infiltration and, and icicle formation. Lastly, I just want to look at the uh, GLS insulating paint. Um, so 
normally the structures around will be responsible for uh, paint on structures, uh, but usually the paint serves only to protect uh, the metalwork against corrosion, and the ram will normally intervene to reapply the paint uh, when it's broken down and corrosion begins to take place and, uh, and affect the load carrying capacity of the structure. This is generally a very slow process and not one that typically carries a critical safety concern. Uh, the use of the GLS paint, however, does, um, because the GLS does provide a, a safety function as part of VCCs, the, the structures round was concerned about taking on the responsibility for the maintenance of this paint. Uh, but in response, we were able to respond that uh, the GLS paint is, is actually deemed to be part of the, the OLE system uh, with inspection and maintenance managed by the EMP RAM um, via new um, overhead line work instructions. And, and in that way, we're able to assuage those particular concerns from the, from the structures RAMs. So I'm just going to pass back to Tom. I'll just move the slide on, Tom. Okay, so thanks, Andy. Um, so yeah, all, all of that that type of uh, thinking and, and and topics in in structures and and track um, culminated in in the production of this this one pager document as we call it. So I've, I've just done some screenshots there of the the different parts. So part A for general information, B for structures, C for track, part D for the OLE proposals, and then the the part at the bottom is where the the RAMs give their endorsement and caveats or, or comments. Um, the idea of this one pager is that each discipline CRE fills in their, their respective discipline parts uh, early on in the design process and then works together to optimize the, the system solution. Um, it, I don't know if you can see on the part A, yeah, we can just, just over here. It asks for three um, high level options. Um, that's to sort of give a flavour and a feel for what it would cost for a full bridge recon to achieve full compliance, similar for um, a full track lower to achieve full um, you know, electrical clearance compliance. And then option three, we end up with a, a voltage control clearance option, either, either on its own or in combination with some form of, of lowering the, the height of the rail. Um, it asks for links to CSM risk assessments, which um, you know are often required under under the group standard, and any deviations needed, um, such as um, ballast depth or or minimum contact wire height, which we have to um, deviate against. And then once the project assurance team is is happy with you know the information is is you know as as we all want it, we then take that to the RAM teams and hold a workshop. And then that's where they um, sign on the dotted line at the bottom for for an agreement in principle that you know this option can be taken forward. Um, as I say, ideally, our view is this this process or this type of work is something that should be done uh, during Grip Three to then allow single options to be developed at Grip Four. Um, we're a little bit behind on TRU because this was an evolving piece of work. Uh, so we're having to deal with some of this in, in GRIP4, but yeah, certainly the recommendation is for electrification projects to really think about this in the in the earlier GRIP stages. Moving on. Um, Tom, so, uh, Tom, I think we're limited for a bit of time now, so I'll just... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll yeah. list through. So um, just some quick examples on how um, effective this has been on TransPennine route upgrade or the, the potential for it. Um, just a quick overview of the route there, Manchester through to York. But the real game changer is is on the the west of Leeds, uh, trans, trans, TRU west of Leeds. So the, it's a complex route. There's six tunnels and 77 bridges at Grip Two. Um, the project aimed for full compliance, 370 mil clearance, large interventions required at all four tunnels plus 45 bridges. During GRIP3, we reviewed the opportunity for what voltage control clearances can do, and that now gives us the potential to save all the tunnel interventions and approximately 22 bridges. So just to talk in numbers, that that, that could be a, a saving of, of hundreds of millions of pounds. So it's a real, on, on certain schemes, complex schemes with lots of structures, it's a real game changer. Thanks, Tom. I'm just going to show a couple of specific examples from TIU where we're using VCCs to electrify three structures. Uh, 
The first example is Catherine Street Tunnel in Ashton under Line uh, to the east of Manchester. It's about a 92 yard long tunnel, cut and cover, so it's more like a, a long bridge. So shown on the left, uh, the original solution for electrification uh, in the TIU December 2017 submission using conventional electrical clearances was for the track to be lowered and the concrete invert installed. As well as the invert works, the location of the tunnel in a shallow cutting meant that extensive works to retain the cutting slopes on both approaches was also required. So using the VCC principle, the diagram on the right shows that the tunnel could be electrified without a track lower, uh, without the introduction of the invert and without the works to the retaining walls and the cuttings on the approaches. Moving on to the next slide, uh, this is um, Stamford Street Bridge. Uh, a bridge carrying a major road and lots of services across the railway, also in Ashton. So using conventional clearances, the solutions were either a reconstruction involving significant disruption for road users and diversion of services, or a large track lower, which like Catherine Street, would have to have considered the stability of cutting slopes and retaining walls, installation of a new track drainage system, uh, such was the, uh, the extent of the depth, uh, depth of dig required. So working with, with our RAMs and, and challenging our designers uh, at times to kind of sharpen their pencils, uh, we're currently looking at how we can um, use VCCs to um, allow us to retain this particular structure. Uh, we're looking at a number of areas, for example, the structure itself, we've identified um, that we can remove the concrete flange covers to the bottom flanges of the uh, concrete and case steel beams. Um, these were a maintenance liability for the structure's RAM anyway, and uh, their removal gives us 65 millimetres of, of additional headroom. Uh, we could also see that the uh, jack arch construction allows us to locate bridge arms within these jack arches, so we're only dealing with the, uh, the clearances to the, to the wires. And looking at the track, uh, we're reviewing the track componentry, uh, for example, looking to use shallow depth EG47 sleepers, looking at ballast depths, and also reviewing the, uh, the track maintenance lift allowance, which is being included within the OLE design. So to support that uh, reduced TMLA, uh, we're being asked by the, the, the track RAM to carry out a, a whole life cost assessment. Um, so I'll hand back to, to David, who'll perhaps explain that in a bit more detail. Sorry, just worry of time. Uh, we, we've incorporated whole life cost analysis. We've got a team doing that, and we've looked at different options for different track maintenance uplifts. I know we did a poll before. I don't know if that could be shared at the end of the presentation. But in essence, from the RAM perspective, we're going for 50 mil as a starting point and using 25 as the last resort. We have done some work on Bolton to Wigan. Ultimately, it's paying dividends there. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail there, just bearing in mind the time scale. And then finally, it's just that we're finding this is the most cost effective way of electrifying the network if we can work through this process. And all we're trying to say is early engagement in the group stages with, and also with the stakeholders. And this multidisciplinary approach does seem to pay dividend. Uh, thanks for the time and apologies for slightly overrunning. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Andy, David, and Tom. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Brian Whitney back for the, the fourth and final Q&A session of today. So uh, we've had lots of questions come through, which is, which is really good. So just a reminder to uh, attendees, please use the, the question functionality on the right-hand side of your screen. So the first question uh, is, is for Brian. Uh, so this comes from uh, Pete Halliwell. So, uh, are floors uh, progressing to defects in the rail an invitable income, sorry, start again, an invitable outcome of manufacturing, shipping and installation processes? Uh, good question, thanks Peter. Uh, I think the simple answer is no. I think modern steels are much more reliable. Uh, one thing I think our main defects now are surface initiated. So it's wheel rail contact managing that effectively. Uh, modern vehicles often more consistent in how they run on the track, so defects are more concentrated, perhaps in the same part of the rail. In some cases, less wear. Now there's a, a bit of a balance between surface damage and, and wear. 
so a number of things but no i think from from transport handling and steel production rail production modern steel processes most of our damage now which we see is is in service uh, prim primarily about 75 percent of our defects are now surface initiated i hope that answers peter's question thank you brian uh, so Moving on to the next question then, so this is for the TRU team. So there's a few questions which I'm going to try to summarise into uh, one. Uh, so it's from Andy Franklin and, and Carl Baker. So it's really, it's on the, the impact on VCC and also managed trap position for the maintainer. Uh, how, what, what impacts does it have on the maintainer and, and how receptive has the infrastructure maintainer been to this change? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you that as a starter, um, Liam. We're, we're we're working closely with um, the maintenance teams, and and every time we're in a position where we believe uh, the the solution we've got in the one page is the way forward, we are discussing with the uh, track maintenance engineer. So, for example, the one that uh, Andy showed for Caffin Street, uh, we'll get the run by him, but we're also going to the track maintenance engineer to make sure they're bought into applying, I think in that case, it was going to be a 50 mil track maintenance uplift mm. allowance. And they then know that they're going to have to kind of up their resources or get some support to manage that track to that position in the future where they haven't done that uh, normally uh, to that level. I hope that answers that one. Thanks. Dave, uh, so next question going back to Brian. So uh, this is from a comment from Bob Hazel. Uh, it says, on your historic broken rail graph, you, you've missed the key action which is missing, which was the appointment of Mr. Whitney. Uh, I'm not sure that's a question, just a nice comment. So I'm sure you'll take that. Uh, so the, uh, the next one from Andy Franklin is um, uh, 50 breaks by 2030 is a challenge. Um, with significant breaks driven by track geometry faults, is there an intent to link RDMS and Tiger with an integrated approach to rail management? Uh, good question, Andy. I think, yes, it is an aspiration, and I think we might start to do that soon with the work that is currently ongoing on our enhanced decision support tool, where we can start to link data together. Uh, it's a big challenge and, and one I firmly believe in because a lot of our rail breaks are a result of an underlying track geometry fault. And it comes back to making sure we understand the root cause and fix the symptoms, uh, not just the, or we fix the root cause, not just the symptoms. So yes, I am hoping, and that's part of the work that's looking at integrating track geometry data, rail defect data, a number of other uh, asset information streams uh, in the Eddy current uh, or in the enhanced uh, decision support tool. So yes, hopefully it's something we should see coming in the next uh, 18 months or so with the uh, the rollout of that equipment of, of those systems there that bring large number of data streams through common location. Thank you, Brian. Um, so next question is is for for Tom Kemp. So this is from Phil Philip Holborn. So who was the DPE for Cardiff intersection bridges, so it's battle hardened. Um, one key issue which you didn't mention was the condition of the bridge. Application of insulated coating uh, means inspection of the metal is much harder because of the coating must form a complete electrically insulating seal, it must not be broken. Um, the condition of the bridge before application of the coating is also crucial uh, and water. We had to install water defection gutters to capture the water coming out of the wheat poles. It's not quite as easy a solution as some people think. So, I don't know, Tom, would you like to maybe? Um, sounds sounds like not more of a question, but more some uh, sort of helpful uh, tips. So, what what was the chap's name? Phil, Phil something was it? Phil Holborn. Phil Holborn. So, yeah, if if he wouldn't mind, we'll we'll be in touch with with Phil for any sort of nuggets of information that that he has that we can we can take in with this. So, thank you. Yeah, just to add to that, I might be Phil. If you're available, we might be asking you to present to uh, uh, TRU because uh, it would be good just to know everything you've learnt from that process. I mean, can I just add as well that you know, in, 
involving structures rams as part of the uh, the workshop in hopefully tries to address or at least get onto the table the kind of issues that we have at these structures and you know the the condition the the water ingress that sort of thing and to get a, a discussion in the round is useful and that that involves obviously the, the three main disciplines Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I think we've got time for one more quick question. So this one is for Brian again, and this is from Brian Painter. Uh, so great presentation. So you mentioned um, aggressive OLE infrastructure and the impact to a derailed train. Uh, yeah, how do we make sure this is considered in future potential schemes? I think it's a fair challenge. Uh, it's something I'd not remembered until I revisited the recommendations recently and put the slides together. Uh, I do think there's some challenge and I think the real challenge for the railway is we keep trains on the track because controlling things once they have derailed is always going to be very difficult but uh, I think it is a fair challenge, uh, perhaps we haven't learned and if you look at incidents, uh, Hatfield, uh, the fatalities perhaps were attributable to striking line side furniture, uh, Potter's Bar similarly the stanchions and the tensioning weights were involved or contributing to uh, a number of the seven fatalities at Potter's Bar. So it's a valid point. Uh, I don't think realistic, though, I think simple answer is not very effectively, but certainly our focus has very much been on making sure trains stay on the track um, because there's a whole range of infrastructure or line side structures which uh, present a big risk if the train isn't accurately or isn't properly guided. So yes, yeah, a fair challenge, but I think one that I think Hatfield was seen very much as a track incident. Perhaps some of the lessons and recommendations, it was certainly one of the ones about aggressive infrastructure stanchions that I've not sort of remembered until revisiting it recently. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Tom, David and, and Andy. So that, that draws this, this Q&A session to a close and now uh, that kind of brings me to uh, bring this conference to a close. So I would now like to invite Gareth Evans, professional head of track, to propose a closing vote of thanks. Hi, Liam. Thank you. So not the traditional um, vote of thanks as we're constrained for time, but I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's presented today. Um, I think the technology has worked well for us. It's been a really, really informative morning and I hope everyone who's dialed in and we had about 240, I think, at one point uh, attendees has got a lot, lot out of today. I'd also like to thank all the, uh, the people who submitted questions as part of the Q&A session. That's really sort of embellished the content of the presentations and led to some very uh, interesting, fascinating discussion about uh, how we might apply some of what we've seen presented today more widely. And then last, but by certainly no means least, I'd like to thank the PWI for supporting uh, the conference today uh, and helping organize this amazing agenda we've been through. Uh, and specifically, um, I'd like to thank Liam, Dan Malloy uh, and Kate for making today happen, training all of us presenters on the technology uh, and producing uh, you won't have seen this if you've been an attendee, but a very detailed script behind all of today's proceedings to make sure it went as smoothly as possible. So thank you, everybody. Um, we'll definitely do this again uh, early in the new year, as it's been a really, really incredible seminar, I believe. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that. Gareth. So that, that brings the conference to a close. So thank you all for attending. Uh, so just before you go, just to let you know that the, the recorded conference and materials will all be made available on the PWI website. Uh, also, a feedback survey will be sent out to you shortly. Can I please ask that you take the time to, to fill this in as it will help us improve future events and steer the agenda to be more appropriate covering the subjects that you in the Track Reynolds engineering community want to see. So with that, goodbye everybody and stay safe.